session was a great eye opener on uh, one issue is uh, clean egg production and then clean meat production that is a need of the hour the reason why i'm mentioning before i go to the first speaker is there's a great opportunity for indian exports so india is a great country producing almost you know we are producing 25 crore eggs per day and almost 1.2 crore broilers per day so how can we reach out uh, in the quality terms for example on the other day calcutta we mentioned that there's a great opportunity for exports in meat internationally today it is almost 2 dollars and 2.01 dollars whereas our production cost comes around 1.8 and 1.89 dollars can we not compete the other analogy i want to give is our good friend netherlands is here netherlands is able to supply in the international market 360 eggs uh, with 35 dollars we are competing at 30 dollars so why the differentiation so we can we not meet the challenges which are opportunities and i want uh, all of you to think on this lines that you know not only in the terms of volume we have to go for a value and that is a great opportunity now india going into a third largest economy by 2027 let us focus that you know indian animal husbandry contributes in a greater way to give you a nutshell we are exporting today worth of 1000 crores only so can we not think of 10000 crores of export from india so that is my opening contention and this uh, event of session i welcome my co-chair i welcome my rapporteur all are good friends of mine and uh, we have lined up three speakers for the session very quick uh, look out as uh, mycotoxicosis a growing concern of avian health by dr goling wang and then we have another uh, speaker pakistan poultry industry current challenges and opportunities dr mohammed kashif salim and then innovative hv ac system for poultry research so these are the three things so without uh, adieu i yeah, okay I can continue, no problem. So, Varma ji gives me, you know, hmm. I'm like a gap filler. In fact, I was not prepared to be a chairman here. He said, koi nahi, aare, aar, aap aajau, chairman bano. So, wohi uh, say, you know, we, are, we will be like that. Don't worry. To continue to the avoiding a glitch, since it is going online, let me give you an Indian perspective when I went to Europe. The VIV Europe, when I went, uh, Indian uh, poultry sector was not known to that level. Today, you will not believe when I go to any part of India in southern India, uh, my farmer says that I am doing half a million, I am doing one million layers. One million, two million layers. Uh, that is the, the level of confidence we have. And, uh, and uh, to the international audience also, I will give you, we have one company called Happy Hen Farm. Sorry, uh, which is, a, is getting a, very slow. Good. I think uh, my speaker from which place is joining? Netherlands. 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 Welcome, welcome. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Gunlan Wing? Can you hear me? You are, you are on mute. You can unmute. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Welcome. Namaste from uh, India all over to Netherlands. Yeah. Hi, greetings from Netherlands. Um, you can start. Sorry, I was... Sir, before uh, starting, I, I will okay, read I'm out the brief. Right okay. Okay. One second, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, my colleague will give you an introduction of yours. So, welcome today's opening batsman, Dr. Guanling Wang, a distinguished speaker of uh, today's sessions. Uh, Dr. Guanling Wang is the global product manager for the mycotoxins risk management program of the Celco, the feed additives brand of the Nutrico. Uh, he obtained his bachelor's and master degree in veterinary science in China and then moved to Europe to obtain another two degree in the sustainable animal nutrition and feeding and business administration respectively. During the career within the uh, Nutrico, he continued to gain the knowledge in the raising mycotoxins challenges and in uh, geographical dynamics. Since 2017, he has been dedicated to developing a portfolio to mitigate mycotoxins for uh, poultry producers in 80 countries. Let us hear from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Guan Ling. Welcome, Guan Ling. Ni hao, Guan Ling. Hello. Can I start? Yeah, please. Yes. Most welcome. You can start. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone. Good morning. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, yesterday's conference very much, and I have the great pleasure to be invited by the organizer to kick off the day. And my topic is um, a mycotoxicosis, a growing concern for avian health. Um, so let me just move the slides to the next one. Yep. So I prepare three subtopics for today. The first one, I want to go through the mycotoxin trend in 2023. For, particularly for the poultry feed. And second and third one would be to update some scientific research progress on the mycotoxin, uh, their toxicity, and what's the impact on the poultry production. And most importantly is how the performance of uh, some technologies works out of those models. Um, so this is just a, a overview of the key mycotoxins that we are looking at from the industrial perspective. Well, if you know uh, a little more about this area, you know at this moment, uh, there are more than 500 mycotoxins identified and the list is still growing day by day because researchers made some progress every day to figure out the new chemicals are produced by mold. Um, there are also some connected topics are very interesting because some mycotoxins can be contributed to the plant in the field as the self-production of the plant itself. And those congelation will be gone when the animals are eating the plants. And those mycotoxins are hidden from those congelation. That's what we call mask mycotoxins. So the original mycotoxins already bring a big threat, but the real uh, situation on the animal level are more complex. Plus, we call a group of emerging mycotoxins. Those are a group of uh, mycotoxins are not new in the field, but they are new to us as the human being or animal production uh, supply chain. Um, so along the years, uh, we are talking about uh, a huge group of uh, chemicals which are toxic to different animal species. And for poultry, relatively, we say they are less sensitive to a certain mycotoxins compared to the other species, but still we see like aflatoxins are so toxic to the animal, to the birds. We see ochratoxins and T2 toxins are very sensitive to the birds, but along the progress of the researchers, there are new research um, um, proof that some mycotoxins like dioxin, valenone, fumonacins used to be considered as less toxic to birds and nowadays are also very important to look at. Um, I know there are so many um, uh, information at this moment published either by the private sector, like CELCO, or published by the local government, uh, for instance, the European Union uh, uh, legislation bodies. They publish regularly the mycotoxin uh, analysis to give the people uh, a trend for the last year. And just a few days ago, my uh, colleague, Dr. Swami Haladi and uh, Abhinash, they have made a fantastic webinar where we have more than 1,000 restaurants from the globe. And it's, it's showing people, it's particularly for this industry, have strong interest in knowing what is happening uh, in the last, uh, let's say, a few months. And also people try to see the outlook in 2024, what is happening. So as the global uh, international uh, company, we have access to uh, um, a lot of the countries with the business partners. Uh, for instance, in 2023, we have collected more than 66,000 analysis and came from 35 countries. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the profile of those analysis, so majority are from raw materials, while the rest are from complete feed. And on the right hand of my presentation, uh, on the top, you can also see the distribution of the analysis has been done by uh, mycotoxin. It shows very equally the interest from all of the world on all major six mycotoxins. There was no dominant um, interest on certain mycotoxins, but I would say the interest was well split across the, uh, the six mycotoxins. Um, I'm not going to, of course, repeat the webinar that we had a few weeks ago, uh, but uh, the full recording of that fantastic webinar is available on the website of CELCO. Um, I was very glad to see 
the well-known social media, uh, all about feed, also pick up the webinar and um, provide a very good executive summary on their website. So if you have time, go through the uh, full recording. That's my encouragement. But if you are busy agenda, then I would recommend the executive summary from the All About Feed, where you can have more deep uh, insights about what was going on in 2023. So I just took a few uh, snapshots from my colleague's presentation to give the, our idea about what is happening for the poultry production, uh, particularly from the poultry feed. Um, on the left side, you see two bars, uh, the pink one from, from the broiler feed and the blue from the uh, layer feed. Just give people the idea about what's the contamination percentage in all the analysis uh, among the uh, poultry feed. So we see for aflatoxins, both broiler feed and layer feed are super uh, contaminated, 74% of each. And we see, for instance, uh, another high on the xerylenone and the uh, uh, fumonacins. Those are picking up. Uh, however, we know from the research side, those two mycotoxins are, lit, uh, are relatively less sensitive to the birds. On the other hand, we see aflatoxins, T2 toxins are also catching up the trend compared to the, fall, uh, the previous years. Um, but this gives us a, a very good idea of, about which mycotoxin that we see more often in the broiler or layer feed. On the right hand of the presentation, you can also see the median concentration of each mycotoxin. While we didn't really go to the average uh, concentration as we used to uh, do this for the previous years, because along the growth of the uh, number of analysis, we believe the median value will give us more, um, let's say the representative outcome, uh, which are uh, used in uh, which can be used in our daily life because average concentration sometimes give us um, yeah gives too much weight to the outliers either the analysis result goes too high or too low but the median value are really uh, a good example to reflect what is happening on our daily life so I'm not gonna to bother you all the details of that uh, mycotoxin uh, survey uh, but uh, again I encourage you to go through that uh, from self website where you have more details. Um, during my daily job in the last seven years, uh, to support animal producers to mitigate mycotoxins, we always received the question, whenever a sample showed positive results, meaning the mycotoxins are fair, what actions the animal producers are supposed to take? Should they always use such technologies or should they always, uh, the customers are concerned by those contamination? The answer is no from technical side because it's all about risk mitigation. It's all about whether the risk is low, media or high. And by that, we encourage the customers to take different actions. And I'm showing the table for both broiler chickens and breeders and also for commercial layer hens that there is a well-defined uh, risk level per each subspecies per, uh, per mycotoxins. So this is uh, what we recommend customers to look at uh, the result from their own uh, sample analysis and define the right action to mitigate a certain mycotoxin. Of course, um, there are more than that on the, uh, in the future because we know um, we see more and more co-contamination of multiple mycotoxins in one sample, which means customers are facing not only single mycotoxin with high level, but multiple mycotoxins, and each of them might be in a moderate level. So the reality and how to make the risk mitigation um, uh, on that complexity is a challenge, uh, but my colleagues are doing a great job and we are developing what um, we call risk equivalence uh, equ uh, equation, uh, which will be published this year. So customers will have the chance to integrate the risk assessment by each mycotoxins into a group. So by that, there will be a more, uh, let's say, progress this year so we can support the industry better. So based on uh, the risk assessment on the single mycotoxins, so here, my colleagues also made a summary uh, of for each 
uh, feed, which single MAC toxin uh, showing the, uh, let's say, the, the bigger concern. Uh, for instance, if you see the, the up, upper part of this slide, it's a broiler feed. And if we take aflatoxins um, in the bottom, you still see 20% of the broiler feed uh, among all the analysis showed very high risk and another 21%, so the medium risk, uh, followed by 18% low risk. So, and this is just to give you the, uh, um, some idea about looking at the concern mic toxin. What we are facing now is still, let's say up to uh, more than 50% of the uh, broader feet are contaminated by aflatoxins, which are following, let's say, more than low risk, which calls for the action to the, uh, to the customers that we need to be more careful to monitor the mycotoxin trend uh, in, in your feed and then using some rep analysis or maybe the lab analysis to check back what's the root problem and then solve that either from the more clean uh, raw materials or we use some feed technologies to solve that on the feed level. Uh, we also have uh, a great uh, new development this year we call Microbi series. Um, so there are six episodes about mycotoxin analysis published every two weeks. So here is the QR code and everybody has the uh, 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 let's say possibility to uh, be part of this journey together with us uh, because we want to share more recent update with the uh, industry to help us to safeguard uh, the efficiency of the animal production. So again, that will be the first part of my presentation today to give you the overview of the trend in 2023, particularly in the poultry feed. And the second part of my today's uh, presentation is about, okay, what are the recent scientific models are developed? As we knew from uh, 20 years ago, um, researchers were looking into a single MAC toxin uh, challenge with super high level to challenge birds in order to visualize the impact of MAC toxins on the animal health and performance. But along the years, there are more researchers are looking into the gap where the research models are a bit uh, too aggressive than the, uh, let's say, the daily uh, farm operation. So. Uh, for instance, I'm sharing one of the results from Dr. Malati. Uh, she's a, a well-known researcher in this area, also originally from uh, uh, China, uh, sorry, from India, together with my other two colleagues, Lane and Dr. Yaming, to develop uh, a scientific model, uh, see what's the impact on a moderate level of aflatoxins in the broilers. So in this trial, uh, we saw uh, over 42 days trial period, so 150 birds per treatment were used, and we were using uh, 500 P uh, ppb aflatoxin to challenge birds, which were far less than it used to be. It used to be like a 2 ppm or 3 ppm, even higher, but now this is the 500 ppb aflatoxins is so far uh, one of the latest uh, model showing moderate level of aflatoxins can still um, visualize the challenge on birds. And the, the key observation is that this model showing uh, the contaminated feed decreased the final body weight of the birds uh, after 42 days by 25%. Um, so this is very significant, the decrease uh, on the animal performance. Um, followed by some organ uh, development. Uh, the mycotoxin challenge significantly increased their relatively uh, uh, weight gain, weight uh, uh, against the live body weight, which is meaning the, um, the organs are suffering from the mycotoxin exposure. Uh, on the same time, we also see the antibody titers on day 21 and the day 40, uh, 42 to Newcastle disease and IBD were also suppressed by the oh, the results were also published in a scientific journal uh, by the researcher. Um, we use the same model to, um, let's say, to visualize or to evaluate some uh, technology. For instance, 
we have uh, from Selco, we provide Toxamex, which it contains 100% a smactite based a mycotoxin binder. So we use 2 kg per ton uh, dosage in this trial, and we see um, final body weight of the birds were increased by 15%, and average steady gain were increased also by 50%, and the feed conversion ratio were improved by uh, 13 points. This gives uh, a lot of uh, a good indication about what our animal producers can expect after applying this uh, product. Uh, so by using the local uh, information, for instance, the price information, the feed cost information, so we were able to calculate the return of the investment on the customer level would be uh, 18, sorry, 19 to 1, which bring a very good result. Um, so that was just one of the uh, uh, sharings I want to uh, give today is about uh, aflatoxin challenge because connect to what I previously talked, aflatoxins in both broiler feed and the layer feed in 2023 were still the most uh, uh, dominant uh, mycotoxin in the, in the field. Um, however, like I said, the co-contamination of multiple mycotoxins and their interaction between mycotoxins are also the reality. So that complexity demands more technology to be combined to uh, serve the customer uh, better in order to improve their animal production efficiency. And here, this is just a summary of, the, uh, of each concerned mycotoxin on the poultry level. What are their impacts? Uh, not only the feed intake will be uh, suppressed, but also, for instance, uh, egg size, uh, will be reduced, egg production, for, of course, will be suppressed. Um, for instance, dong dioxinivalanone will damage the gut integrity. Um, some alpha toxins for, also has the same, uh, uh, let's say, negative impacts. So considering the co-contamination, co um, there is a need to develop something which we integrate both of actions together. So, like I said, some single mycotoxin uh, adsorbents were already very popular in the field. Um, however, not all the mycotoxins can be well adsorbed. Uh, for instance, deoxynivalenone, fumonacins, and even for acrotoxins, T2 toxins, um, in the real guard situation, the, the binder uh, efficiency will be much less than what they are showing from the in vitro. And therefore, we consider to have a better gut wall protection in the uh, solution level. And also the immunity modulation is very much necessary to be part of the, the whole solution. Because by using mycotoxin adsorbent and also the gut wall protector, we expect the bioavailability of the mycotoxins will be reduced. By this way, there will be less uh, mycotoxins exposure to the animals. Uh, however, for those mycotoxins who always have a chance to go into the bloodstream of the animals. There, we need a remediation strategy, for instance, to protect the gut integrity and also, for instance, to improve the gut immunity. Dr. Vang, two minutes more. Sorry? Two minutes more, two minutes. Okay, two minutes more, yeah. okay. I will be um, uh, jump over because there are also some more progress on the multiple mycotoxin challenge in the broilers. So this one also confirms the mycotoxin contamination decreased uh, body weight of the broilers by 14%. Um, by applying uh, integrated uh, solution, we call Toxo XL at Selco. Uh, with different dosage, we see the benefits on the customer levels are also pleasant. So the ROI can be up to uh, 3.4 to 1. Another study in the layer hands uh, were also interesting because not only the egg laying rates were compromised, but also the egg quality, for instance, egg shell strengths, the, the mycotoxin residue in the eggs were also observed in the uh, negative control group. The results were also published in the scientific journal where we saw uh, the improvement by 2 kg of the Toxo uh, XL and the benefits on the customer level uh, showing the ROI up to almost four to one. There was also a recent uh, breeder study were conducted in the on the commercial uh, breeder farm. So this was brand new according to our knowledge 
uh, there are not so many breeder studies available. So, for instance, this study showing the oviduct index after eight weeks exposure to multiple mycotoxins, uh, aflatoxin, dog, and octotoxins uh, were compromised. Average egg laying rate were also decreased. The hatchability, which was most important uh, parameter for the producers, were also increased significantly. The results were published in the um, Journal of Food and Chemistry Toxicity uh, by applying the, the product on different dosage that, for instance, one kg per ton dosage were able to increase the hatchability by almost 2.6% uh, and two kg uh, dosage were improving the, the hatchability by more than 6%. So there are some short concluding remarks. The mycotoxins continues to pose a significant threat to the poultry industry. While economic losses are very unavoidable at this moment because of the poor weight gains and also the compromised feed efficiency, uh, this really calls for the action to uh, have integrated approach for mycotoxin management, including a more clean uh, raw materials to be uh, sourced. Also, if you cannot avoid uh, uh, that contaminated raw materials, some feed technology have to be considered on the feed level. Um, the use of the science proven feed technology is um, something very uh, a, a big help uh, for the users to consider uh, for the daily operation. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I want to keep in contact with all of you. If I have time, I want to take further questions. Otherwise, uh, you are welcome to send, send email to me we can discuss about the related topics. Thank you, Dr. Wang. So lucidly, you put the landmark for you know threat and everything. I want all of you to clap. Yeah. I think questions we'll have it at the end because you know we can listen to all the speakers. So from Netherlands, now we need to fly to Pakistan. So welcome, yeah. Dr. Uh, Mohammed Kashim Salim. Our <laughs> moderator, Dr. Rajendran, will introduce. Uh, Dr. Mr. Distinguished Speaker of the today's session, Dr. Mohammad Kasif Salim. Uh, his topic is Pakistan poultry industry, current challenges and opportunities. Since uh, the brief introduction about him, Dr. Mohammad Kasif Salim uh, uh, did his DVM in 2001 and a MSc Veterinary Pathology 2003, PhD in Veterinary Pathology 2010 from the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan. He was awarded with the U.S. National Academy of Science One Health Fellowship in 2016-17. Currently working as a tenured uh, associate professor in the Department of Pathology, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. He is working on the toxicological pathology and infectious disease of poultry. Uh, he has uh, supervised more than 60 MPhil and four PhD students. At present, he is uh, supervising three PhD students and 10 MPhil students. He has completed three research projects and currently uh, four research grant of total amount of more than 25 million Pakistan rupees. Dr. Salim is an experienced and a renowned consultant poultry pathologist for the public and private sectors. He is a member of the National Disease Control Committee for the Poultry Diseases. He has uh, won research productivity award two times from the uh, Pakistan Science and Technology uh, based on the quality research. He has published more than 150 research papers. Uh, impact factor more than 320 in well-reported journals. He is a senior academic advisor to the Dean Faculty of Veterinary Science. He is an associate editor of Pakistan Veterinary Journals, a member of the editorial board, uh, Journal of uh, Elementology, Poland. Uh, he is a national, uh, national branch uh, secretary of uh, WVPA, Pakistan. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Dr. Mohammed Ji. I want all of you to clap and uh, welcome, Mohammed Ji. Your audio is yeah. not coming. Aapka awaz nahi aa rahe. Abhi nahi aa rahe. Shayad ab rejoin karna hai to dekhiye. Sometimes audio is a thing. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, abhi sun rahe. Okay, it's, it's fine? Yeah, it's fine. You can go ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, due to short of time, uh, he has a very long introduction. Now we will jump to my presentation. As uh, Dr. Verma discussed with me uh, to have uh, some uh, general overview of Pakistan poultry industry, 
and then I will briefly touch the current issues uh, that we are facing in Pakistan. So first about the overview of Pakistan poultry industry. Uh, uh, currently uh, in Pakistan, we have around 73 million commercial layer and uh, around 1,700 uh, broilers, that is market age broiler used for meat purpose. And we have a 15, almost 16 million breeding stock. And that is a, a trend of the gradual increase of poultry birds from uh, 20, 22 to 23. And they were chicks were around 1,800 million number annually. And um, uh, total poultry in Pakistan is uh, around uh, um, uh, 1900 million number of birds and the poultry meat is total uh, 2160 metric ton that we are annually producing and these are the facts and figures that poultry meat is uh, about 39.24 percent of total meat production in the country this sector provides direct or indirect uh, employment to 1.5 million people and the total investment in the poultry industry is around 1100 billion Pakistani rupees. And this is 7.3% 7, 7 annual growth. And livestock is now a major shareholder along with the agriculture. That is almost 63% of the agriculture GDP in Pakistan. And Pakistan is the 11th largest poultry producer in the world. And regarding the uh, current uh, scenario of Pakistan poultry industry, around for more than 40,000 environmentally controlled houses are present. These are the broiler houses, and single house has a capacity of 30,000 birds. And conventional sheds are now decreasing in number due to low performance. In the commercial uh, layer, both modern and uh, local battery cages are present and uh, having a capacity of uh, 400,000 to 100,000 birds on a single place and each house has a capacity of more than 100,000 birds. And uh, breeders uh, are uh, on the floor and also in the colony cages, but totally environmentally controlled. And more than 200 feed mills are present throughout the country. And uh, major poultry hub is the Punjab province, that is the central part of Pakistan. And poultry processing is nowadays growing business in these days. Now, moving towards the challenges we are facing, because I am working on these diseases also, Infectious bronchitis is a major problem nowadays that we are facing, that is an avian coronavirus infection, and everyone is familiar with the last pandemic of human COVID. So, and vaccination is only partially successful due to continuous, due to, due to continuous emergence of the new antigenic variants. Around 50 different IBV genotypes have been recognized worldwide, some with the restricted geographical distribution. The target tissue for IV is respiratory tract and kidneys and oviduct alpha. Recent uh, study revealed that there is a presence of new strains designated as uh, PARC 973, uh, previously reported by our colleague from National Agriculture Research Center, Dr. Khaled Naim Faja and his team. And the objectives of this study were the molecular epidemiology of IBV and its variants and phylogenetic analysis of isolates from positive samples, and we did a brief experiment of its immunopathogenesis. So this was a brief layout of how we process the samples. Actually, this was a study of one of my PhD students, and it is, was also part of a research project that we collected 2,720 samples from the field. And this was a layout of the pathogenicity of the uh, isolated strains in the commercial layers. Regarding the uh, epidemiological sample that we collected, uh, overall the 625 samples were positive out of these almost 3,000 samples, and it was 23% prevalence of IV. And this all was the molecular data, uh, RT-PCR based. In the layer, it was comparatively higher side, 26%, and in broader, it was 20%. And this we published in Pakistan Veterinary Journal. Uh, recently in 2023, uh, it was a part of my PhD student, Ahad Fiaz, his PhD thesis. And then we go for the phylogenetic analysis of the basis of S1 gene sequence and the UAF isolates 9 and 10. These were clustering with the PK973 already reported from uh, Islamabad NARC. And that, that was a, a lineage G124. And UAF isolates are also indicating the gap with the vaccinal strains. 
that we uh, confirmed from the deduced amino acid sequence that UAF isolate, UAF mean University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, our isolates showed highest similarity with the mass type and only 72% with the 491-like QX type. There was a gap of 20 to 28% immunity between the field virus and the vaccines used for the IBV in Pakistan. Then in the pathogenicity study, we found that uh, we give infection um, a challenge to the one group and other was control. And the, uh, on the weekly basis, you can see the uh, production that was gradually increasing in the control group and it was uh, uh, decreasing in the um, group infected with the IBV. And in the overall, uh, there was a decrease in production parameter and also egg weight was decreased. Uh, in the uh, 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 12 or 11 week, you can see a clear comparison of the uh, egg weight that was 61 gram in the control group and 50 gram in the um, group infected with the IBV because IBV affect both internal and external egg quality. And the egg production parameter that was uh, um, drastically there was decrease in the 12 overall I am summarizing in the 12 week that you can see 66 percent production in the control and 28 percent in the infected group. Actually these were the layers the, those were having almost uh, 80 week age that we use for the experimental purpose so 66 percent that was a normal production at that time. And these were the eggs after infection when we collected the small um, size eggs, misshapen eggs and wrinkled appearance on the eggs, you can see the comparison. And this, this was a typical ligand that we are facing the reproductive form of IBV from last two to three years. And that this is an important ligand that now frequently seen in the field that the water filled cyst in the abdomen, in the cerebral cavity. And the, in the lower one, you can see the severe nephritis in the birds. Uh, when we go for the histopathology, that was acute tubular necrosis indicated by the arrows and the severe necrotic changes in the tracheal epithelium and uh, cilia were wiped off. So outcome of these studies were that the results of the current study, uh, unvaccinated birds show high disease prevalence and experiment did show stasis, and there was immunity gap of 22 to 28%. This immunity gap is possible reason for continuous outbreak of IBV despite of the vaccine schedule. Pathogenicity assay in white leg horn birds egg weight less than 43 gram, egg production less than 26 percent was decreased, D-shaped and wrinkled eggs. Now briefly about uh, another disease, a chicken anemia. I also have gone some papers from India also. Recent years uh, they reported from Briler, but we started working on this disease in 2010, our research group first time working. Chicken anemia virus is emerging disease in Pakistan. It was first identified in Japan in 1979 and it is an emerging quality pathogen belonging to genus gyrovirus and family Cercovirides. The result of our epidemiology of 2070 to 21 indicated that 17.9% farms were positive for CV, and this is one of the leading immunosuppressive risks. And it indicates chicken anemia is endemic in layers, and chicken anemia is leading to heavy economic losses due to immunosuppression, although problem was less in broiler as there was a proper vaccine schedule in the broilers. So this is very important that parent flock vaccination can control chicken infectious anemia. And the in we found the severe uh, uh, anemia hematocrit value of 10.9 to 17 percent and hemoglobin level 5.3 to 6.6. So first time we observed the particular hemorrhages on the heart. You can say see by the yellow arrow. And we repeatedly see this ligand and then we experimentally produce that and we also reported this in Pakistan Veterinary Journal. And the results of the phylogenetic analysis also indicated that our samples, uh, 14 samples of, uh, on the partial nucleotide sequence space. And it lead to severe necrotic changes in the PERSA and, and uh, lymphocytic depletion and ultimately it will lead, lead to the immunosuppression. And uh, similar changes were observed in the thymus of the bird infected with the chicken infectious anemia. Now briefly about uh, old disease, but in a new fashion nowadays, foul adenovirus that is re-emerging in Pakistan. Uh, as the, I think many people know, that in 80s, this disease was first time reported in Pakistan in 1987. That was a um, uh, first time our one of our leading scientists, Professor Njem, reported in 1989 from Sindh province near Karachi. That was a 
um, hydropericardium syndrome. The disease was present globally, but that was inclusion body hepatitis. But we have excessively you know, hydropericardium. Similarly, this disease was reported in India and Kuwait, in Mexico. So um, for a long time, this disease disappeared due to continuous vaccine schedule in the open houses. But as we shifted towards environmental control houses, so this vaccine was stopped. And the, from last um, um, uh, after the introduction of the environmentally controlled houses, up to 10 years, there was no report of the Pauladino virus. And e even people stopped vaccination in the parent flock. So now, from last two to three years, the problem is increasing of the Pauladino virus. One of major reasons was also compromise of the feed quality during last one year. There was we were having a issue of soybean import in the country that lead to the compromised quality of the poultry feed. And that um, was having an issue of mycotoxins also that predisposed to Fowlerino virus. So this was our workflow, how we collected these samples. This was also a part of my PhD student. She is working in the uh, now in the government department. Yeah, and we collected 485 samples. Um, and and these um, 485 samples were positive out of 3,375 samples. And uh, on the basis of the Hebzone gene, we uh, developed the PCR. And the overall prevalence was 14.37%. And it was comparatively higher in the layer 15 and in the prior 14%. And this we published uh, that the clinical investigation and molecular prevalence of Fowlerino virus of commercial poultry from Festabar. Then interesting was these were the lien that we seen by hydropericardium, necrotic foci on the liver, and the severe nephritis. These were the common lien found in the field sample that we collected. And, they, uh, and we also go for the uh, histopathology of the positive samples. So it lead to uh, perivascular cuffing in cellular infiltration, in inclusion bodies, intranuclear inclusion bodies. These were the significant lesions. Those were already reported. Then we also go for the molecular characterization. And we did this study in collaboration with the Harbin Berkeley Research Institute, China. My student uh, went there. And uh, we uh, found that. These um, uh, sequence numbers, um, uh, session number we submitted in the gene bank, these were FADV11 strain and FADV4. And we first time did the whole genome sequence of the FADV11 from Pakistan. This was a whole genome sequence that we are uh, that available now in the gene bank and also we published this in the veterinary microbiology. So the, the, this was our UF uh, isolate um, uh, PK FAD18. And this we published first complete gene uh, genome sequence and pathogenistic characterization of Pauladino virus 11. And now our recommendation, this is included in the vaccine for the parent frogs. Now, last part of the, my uh, presentation, few slides regarding the mycotoxin, as my colleague has already given a detailed uh, presentation, but we are having a problem of this effluent okra more in Pakistan because these target liver and kidney. And this actually, this is the main issue of the storage fungi. As we go for the storage of the feed ingredients, so poor storage quality also lead to the fungal contamination and ultimately production of mycotoxins. And our group is working on mycotoxins since 2006, and we have published a lot of data. So this is also one health issue, because if there is a contamination of your grain, ultimately these grain will go into the poultry animal feed, and ultimately human will be end user of the milk or meat. And, uh, and in the, some areas of Pakistan, um, it is more in the Asia Pacific that people use boiled corn or roasted corn. But, and, and in this way, human can directly expose to the mycotoxin. And very important thing is that my, even roasting temperature doesn't destroy mycotoxin. So these are the three important segments of environment, animal and human triangle. So this mycotoxin is also a one health issue. And this was a sample we received from the field. You can see the corn contamination with the fungi, mostly spurgillus flavors and parasitic airs and spurgillus operaceus. And then if you will use this corn in the feed, then next is, the slide is indicating how the feed will have the growth of fungi and toxins in the pockets. And when, when birds will consume this feed, ultimately there will be severe nephritis and hepatomegaly. And this was an experimental study one of our student did that he injected Ocrotoxin in the embryo, and you can say in the one embryo, a one eye is missing, and in the control eye is development. So it leads to teratogenic effects. And similarly, in the lower one, you can see the effect in the neural tube. In the left one, this is the normal neural tube of the chicken, 
proper closure, but in the right, this is improper closure that will lead to the skeletal abnormalities. And these were the, uh, we published recently in different journals regarding the mycotoxin because we are continuously working on mycotoxin uh, issue in Pakistan. Now, uh, this whole study of the IBV and CAV, this was a part of uh, Pakistan Agriculture Research Council funded project, ALP. Um, this is the agriculture linkage program in Pakistan, and I was principal investigator of this project. And in the end, I am really thankful to the organizer, Dr. Verma um, uh, and Dr. Jandran and all the team who invited me to present my data. And this is the recent activity of WVPA Pakistan that we organized in the December 28, 2023. That, that was International Symposium on Poultry Health Challenges. We invited Professor Manir Paul from Herbright Institute. And uh, hopefully next time we will have more uh, speakers from uh, India and other regional countries also. And this is my lab team that is working with me, uh, Avian Molecular and Toxicologic Pathology Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I think I am on time. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Pakistan is a good time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next speaker is there? Or? Yes, sir. Yeah. Dr. Sandeep Gupta is also online or? Who be online? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sandeep. Oh, very nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Now both the speakers who are online, kindly wait once we complete Dr. Sandeep Gupta ji, then we will have the questions. You can introduce Sandeep Gupta ji. Yes. So before this uh, uh, introduction, so one announcement. Those who want to present posters, uh, please display on the poster session. The venue is nearby online uh, examination centers. Uh, the evaluations will start immediately. So please uh, go on the display. So now moving to the next uh, keynote speak, speak, speaker, Dr. Sandeep Gupta. He is going to present the topic on the innovative hatchback systems for the poultry research, a true environmental control system. And, uh, regarding uh, Dr. Sandeep Gupta, he is a managing director of the Ashant Animal Nutrition Private Limited. Uh, he has completed his PhD in animal nutrition in the year 2016. He has published several research articles in reputed international journals and, the, and also presented the paper in the international forum. He is having the patents. Uh, he worked a brief period in the private companies and gained the knowledge on the manufacturing poultry feed free mixes. Then he worked as a freelancer consultant. He started his own company, Dash and Animal Nutrition Private Limited. Uh, Sandeep Gupta, sir, is uh, dedicated to advancing the research based on feed additives and his uh, uh, pursuits of excellence make him a true humanities in the field of animal nutrition. It is a great uh, admiration and anticipation that we welcome Dr. Sandeep Gupta to share his uh, insight and expertise at the WPA conference. Uh, please, Dr. I Sandeep request Gupta. audience to welcome Dr. Sandeep Gupta. Thank you. Over to Sandeep. Hello. Sorry, I have some uh, sore throat. But uh, I will convince. So, Namaskar and uh, welcome to my presentation. So first of all, let me thank you very much to WPA who invited me to share our innovation in the field of poultry research. So today presentation topic is innovative HVAC system for poultry research, a true environment control housing system. So my topic will be covered under the following headings from introduction to over at conclusion. So dear curious minds, today I'm going to take you on a journey through the involvement of state of the art technology in the field of poultry research. As we know, 
this NIANP, which is one of the best institute of India, and it this has state of the art facility for animal research. So what we should do new in the poultry research? You know, as we attend many international conferences and we meet some research fellows and scientists and we discuss uh, facility in their research institutes. Even we meet some uh, colleague of our MNC's companies and uh, they show our technical data of their own institutes. Then we feel and compare what they are doing and what we are doing. How, how much uh, they have collaboration with institute in their areas, how much they have uh, publications in their uh, international journals and how much patent they have for poultry research. So for that purpose, the idea came in my mind behind that how to build up a state of the art facility in the India to support our institute, our private organization and global poultry sector, which can recognize India for this contribution. So before I come on my uh, topic, HVAC housing system, I brief just about that uh, existing housing system. So we know the existing housing system divided in two systems. One is open housing system for research purpose and second one is EC housing for research purpose. So as we know, I will, I will not go more in the depth, as we know the limitation of both housing system, even we cannot control humidity and temperature inside the house homogeneously. So what to say about the other parameters like ammonia, oxygen, carbon dioxide? So if you see here, this is the diagrammatical presentation of a research house. So uh, of course, this is with the uh, environmental control house. So if you see near the pad, temperature and humidity are different and near the fan temperature and humidity are the different. Somewhere physiological parameters can vary with the variation in the housing environment. So to resolve that kind of issue of variation, we increase number of replicate to minimize the standard deviation. So you just, you saw in the presentation of Wang, they have uh, replicate more than 10 or 10, 15 replicates. So, so that kind of thing uh, we want to resolve by the using of next technology of involvement of HVAC system. So even, even in some research work, if suppose objective is directly related to the environment and condition like uh, temperature, humidity, ammonia, oxygen, carbon dioxide. So how to get uh, that standard result with the, uh, dat for the data analysis and in that condition, standard error always high. So if you see number of paper published uh, about the effect of uh, environmental condition on the performance of the poultry. So this is one of the big limitation to how to create own environment for the research purpose. So for this, we, we are depend on the existing present season so, uh, and uh, uh, existing species uh, uh, gaseous exchange in the, in, in the, inside the house. So research house with the HVAC system would be the true solution for the ideal environmental condition. So I hope you read this uh, guideline manual uh, published by CPCSEA uh, by the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy. So I am very thankful to uh, Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy of India and even especially author of this manual. That manual cover all the guidelines regarding the optimum standard condition, housing system, optimum environment condition for the best result in the poultry uh, performance. Even if you see page number of four of uh, regarding that environment and see the point number three, that is already mentioned the research house should be controlled with the HVAC system. So already manual have that kind of thing. So we have to follow for standardization of a, a result in the poultry. So that the HVAC system, now I come on that topic. So who, 
who will who established this hvac system and how it will run so lsda livestock scientific development association in indore who established this hvac system which is act as a bridge in between the institute our scientists students and our private organization for the research purpose and sharing the knowledge so objective of this uh, livestock scientific development association to establish a state of the art uh, fa research facility for our institute scientist and uh, uh, the private organization and also to create skill development by using the facilities of lsda so these are the facilities research house with hvac system advanced laboratory and pellet mill etc so now i come on that hvac system so before the hvac system why we need of the hvac system so number of research already published regarding the certain environmental condition need for the optimum performance if you see here so there are lot of uh, uh, publications regarding that certain value for the temperature humidity oxygen carbon dioxide ammonia level air velocity and also if you if we see the Uh, manual of commercial birds that also shown for that uh, uh, certain environmental condition for the optimum result so on the basis of result we designed that uh, layout for the hvac system in our lsda house so what is the actual hvac actually this is the cover covering the uh, science of engineering chemi chemistry and physics so basically hvac system using the various technology to control temperature humidity and uh, air uh, purity of air inside the enclosed space so and uh, that the uh, on the basis of the principle thermodynamics fluid chemistry uh, mechanics and uh, heat transfer and the component of this uh, hvac system are mainly air handling unit ahu dx system tubular heater bms system humidity temperature air flow sensors smoke detector and software modules so i think that contain lot of physics chemistry so i will just brief function of all the component so dx system it is just like our outer air conditioning unit of our house laboratory or uh, offices so it transfer heat from one one area to another area by using the refrigerant so similarly heat tubular uh, system also transfer the heat by the using the heat coil to control the temperature and humidity inside the house this is the main component if you see right side this is the actual picture of ahu unit which uh, dimension of this ahu unit is around 500 square feet to cover 2000 square feet of research area so basically this is the heart of the uh, hvac system so which uh, pump fresh air inside and collect uh, uh, impure air outside it is it work on the basis of air velocity and air flow these are the air filter using in the hvac system to uh, control the air particle uh, up to 5 micron and 10 micron size volume control dampers just like the valve this connect in between the ahu system and duct so that that the mainly control the air flow and velocity so ducting ducting is the network just like the artery of vein of the heart so that the, uh, carry the fresh air inside and collect uh, return air impure air to uh, through the outside so this the under the ceiling the all the ducting system is spread in the in, inside the house so these are the main component humidity temperature oxygen carbon dioxide and ammonia sensor so these are the very sensitive and with the less fluctuation so according the sensor all the system run in the hvac system bms is just like brain used for the operation maintenance record control and monitoring of the Uh, all the environmental condition parameters so just we put uh, certain value in the system for example if suppose we need 10 ppm ammonia maximum or uh, 20% of uh, oxygen or uh, 32% degree of uh, temperature 40 50% of humidity so just uh, put the value and the, all the system run 
to maintain all the parameter homogeneously inside the house. So this is the VMS connect with the hardware and software, so can be cloud-based and can be operate from the outside and from anywhere. So along with the HBSE system that uh, LSDA has uh, facility of the housing, this is the actual picture of the house. This is just like a laboratory. So it content, uh, it has facility of 840 brawler birds along with the cages for the layer and uh, breeder trials. And uh, it has adjustable pen can be further adjustable uh, according to your design of uh, experiment with 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, birds per uh, replicate. It also has a facility for the water medication. So along with this uh, uh, facility that uh, LSDA have left facility, advanced left facility, which is equipped with the uh, advanced instrument like ICPMS, LCMS, MS, GCMS, MS, HP, HPLC. So we can conduct micronutrient digestibility trial also and analyze all the micronutrient like amino acid, vitamins, trace minerals, along with pesticide, heavy metals, antibiotic residue, uh, mycotoxin, all the things. So along with uh, we have uh, facility of pellet mill that the pellet mill as similar as commercial pellet mill with the capacity of 150 kilogram per hour with crumbling facility. So HBSC system uh, uh, can be proved as a milestone for the future aspect to minimize environmental effect, to minimize standard deviation, control biological effect, reduce number of replicates, reduce signification of the words, high efficacy of data analysis. So it is conclusion, so HBSC system can minimize the effect of environmental factors such as fluctuation in temperature, humidity, oxygen, ammonia, and we can uh, take the optimum result according to the guideline of HP, uh, CPC, SEA, and finally LSDA will serve as a innovative uh, platform, state of the art technology for our institute uh, and private organization. So thank you very much. And just I want to appeal to support the LSDA and shake hand together for the upgradation of the research in the India and become member. And I also appeal to private organization, please uh, use the research facility of Indian institutes. Thank you. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep. You are sounding like an engineer. And I, we need engineers in the research now. Thank you so much. I think uh, you can take the seat. I think we can go. Uh, to Dr. Wang and Dr. Mohammed online, and Sandeep is anyways here. Uh, any questions uh, you can think on? Before the questions, I just want to give you a thought process uh, in continuation with Sandeep. Uh, there is a hatchery in India where they are using completely stainless steel uh, setup and uh, he is using ozone for sterilization. Ozone for sterilization in the entire hatchery. Entire hatchery is constructed by stainless steel. Any guess? Now, Kaun Banega Karorpati. It is our PFI president, Mr. Bittu Danda. He has set up a full facility in Panipat. Himself has constructed the entire hatchery with stainless steel. And ozone, as Sandeep was showing outside, they set up a ozone facility for sterilizing the entire hatchery. These are the innovations. The second innovation I want to throw a question is, there is one researcher again in Pune constructing a broiler house, EC house, entirely net zero concept. Net zero energy. Kuch nahi lenge, kuch nahi denge. Any idea? Any guess again? Gartec is doing it. Gartec is under the research that, you know, they are digging the in the shed under the bottom putting the tunnel system of heating with pipes and other thing, can we use the solar to heat the water, pump that solar water under the shed, that radiation can act as a heat source, and the same thing can be circulated for a net energy supply. So these are the innovations. Don't think poultry from one angle. Poultry has 360 degrees. I like Sandeep's uh, thinking in the futuristic idea, wherein you, know, you have to design uh, engineering marvel for research of the birds. So this is how we can be going global. Are we having Dr. Wang on the line and Dr. Muhammad? 
Any question from the audience to Sandeep or Dr. Wang or uh, to Dr. Muhammad? Any questions from the audience? Audience are fully satisfied with the timing and the management by Dr. Wang and Dr. Muhammad. I think uh, my Jaydeep has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Verma ji also has a Yeah. Verma ji, you can f go first. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Wang and Mohammed for uh, sparing time. And for Wang, it is mo early morning. From four o'clock, he's oh. online, and uh, five o'clock was his. Uh, so kind uh, of it. So, so kind of it. Thank you. Round of applause from India yeah. to so, Netherlands. Yeah. We keep sending roses to you, so we are sending you know claps to you now. <laughs> yeah. So, and Mohammed, I. बहुत अच्छा लगा आपने इसको एक्सेप्ट किया दैट कि आप ऑनलाइन आएंगे आई नो दैट कि इट इट इज अ म्यूचुअल एक्सचेंज ऑफ द रिसर्च वी विल कीप ऑन डूइंग दैट एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच आई जस्ट वांट टू टेल दिस हाउस दैट ही इज सेक्रेटरी ऑफ वर्ल्ड वेटनरी पोल्ट्री एसोसिएशन फॉर पाकिस्तान पाकिस्तान सो थैंक यू बोथ ऑफ यू थैंक यू मोहम्मद जी थैंक यू वांग एंड थैंक यू फॉर द क्वेश्चन या ओके Good morning, Wang. Uh, Sorry, my another introduction is that I am best friend of Dr. Verma, and it is my pleasure. And hopefully, next time I will be physical in India. Most welcome, Jadeep. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Wang, uh, first of all, congratulations for uh, providing us a global mycotoxin uh, review, and some of the platforms you shared that will be useful for us as academician to know the developments of mycotoxin. I just have one specific question. Uh, during your trial, you have mentioned you have taken only males. That is to just avoid a sex effect or any other specific reason. Dr. Bang, can you hear us? Sorry, and I'll I'll come again. Okay. Uh, can you repeat the last part of the? Yeah, yeah. In one of the uh, your research, you have just mentioned that you have taken only males. It is just to avoid a sex effect or any specific reason. I think network oh, issue. Uh, from the cost efficiency perspective, uh, you mean the six mycotoxins, right? Not the, the all of the mycotoxins. I uh, know. Well, so I think it's slide number five where you mentioned you have taken only males for doing your research, Dr. Malti. Male bird, male birds only. Selected male birds. Oh, male birds. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, because by this by this uh, um, yeah some research shows the gender has some impact on the sensitivity to the mycotoxins and uh, from our side that we try to make uh, let's say the, the release a lot more uh, focus on the gender uh, specific and that's also uh, showing you know from the animal child's perspective those cofactors will have some impact on the uh, the result side so therefore, we it was decided to go with the male uh, tricks. Thank you, thank you. And just the curiosity, second one is, uh, what is your opinion about uh, phytobiotics or the herbs, which are now people are using for controlling mycotoxin or some papers are coming regarding that? Do you have any experience on that? Phytobiotics or the herbals for controlling the mycotoxin? For control of oh. products. Um, yeah, we do have a familiar uh, experience uh, uh, technologies. Um, those white things are not in maybe in my belief, but also in my home country, China. Uh, the question remains whether that's a cost efficient uh, option uh, because phytogenics, particularly when you talk about uh, some purified, for instance, the uh, rosemary. Those are quite expensive ingredients. Their efficiency uh, in terms of improvement on the gut uh, level can be good, but from the gut side, see the concern on whether there's a good, uh, there is a good return of investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And there thank are you. Indeed, some so, so we have to consider both type of gut. Thank you, Mohammed Ji. A uh, final uh, thought process, consumer-driven uh, era. So now I think, you know, milk, people want to assess mycotoxins 
M1. Have you thought over, can we have a consumer who want to chuck mycotoxin in chicken, mycotoxin in egg? Kitne log soche malam nai. We are only thinking mycotoxins in, in feed. So now I'm asking, the day will come that as consumer is now demanding M1, whether M1 hai milk mein nahi hai. But roj aayega, the today, tomorrow, day after 10 decades, at one decade, people will start checking mycotoxin in liver of chicken before I consume. People will chuck. I think I'm not a mycotoxin expert, but this College of Veterinary Science, Bangalore, Professor Deva Godaji, followed by our, you know, Haldi Swami, followed by Malti, we are an epicenter of mycotoxin research. So I would throw the audience this question. Think tomorrow that people start checking chicken for mycotoxin. Think tomorrow people start checking mycotoxin in eggs. So that is the future. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Now I'll hand over mic to core chair to give a comments. Any comment if you have? My friend Manjunath, the research expert, says it is already transmitted through the egg. So awareness will come very, very quickly. Get up, pull up your socks. And because you know, as I told you in the beginning, we are in the global arena. India is being watched by every country. So our products also will be watched by every country. So clean egg production, clean meat production, clean milk production. That will be our strategy. Thank you. Any comments from my young energetic Aire and uh, our uh, Jaydeep? Uh, Quick, yes. because we are 147 yes, minutes. Just a last comment. 1047. Uh, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, I just wanted to know, do you have the same facility for layers or diversified birds? Because our institute, CRI, working on the diversified bird like quail. And do you have any plan to extend that? And second is just a suggestion. ICR is now open for MOU to institute like you. So we will welcome you to have a MOU so we can exchange our student. And uh, as you rightly told, the environment control will have a reliable data. So that's the my point of view. Thank you. I have one question to Sandeep sir. Uh, Sandeep sir, you told that uh, uh, you are controlling ammonia level. So are you measuring ammonia level or you are controlling different level of ammonia in the power? You mentioned that if you want 5 ppm, 10 ppm, 15 ppm, how, how this, can it... This is the forcefully we have. If suppose we want to create and we want to check that uh, any efficacy of any product on the different kind of level of ammonia. But that is the, the system control the ammonia what is uh, uh, excreted by the bird if suppose and uh, the uh, optimum level of ammonia suppose uh, as we uh, some references shown that 10 ppm level up to maximum 10 ppm level the, for the best performance so that control on that level if suppose uh, that ammonia excrete beyond that level so that the uh, system will run to maintain only that level Uh, thanks, sir. I just want to refer for the three of the speakers. Dr. Wang has mentioned the trial data uh, where we need seeking to be yes, speak on the global survey contribution of the mycotoxins and what innovations they have done. But few points we need to mention in detail about the date of the trials and the more details, I mean, the formulations which you've taken for the consideration can be in of the microbes. You'll give yeah. next. Yeah. And from Pakistan poultry, Dr. Mohammed, sir, you have mentioned in the initial slide about the total population and uh, the tonnage of the poultry. But the an opportunity, if looking to the global market, if you someone want to interview into the territory pertaining to the any of the segment, the opportunity need to be highlighted uh, much to understand your market, uh, looking to the one slide or two slides of yours as a preview. Uh, rest, uh, the theoretical data from your college is really good. So Sandeep sir, I really feel it is an innovation from the veterinarian from India. Thanks sir and many congratulations to you. Uh, this is much needed 
we have to be driven into the more scientific data and facilities more importantly because the word believe to be uh, have faith in us and europe market only then why not india and particularly the technician and the phd scholar like you if doing like this is really hats up to you and there are few more innovations what share by the uh, our respective mahesh sir uh, those are much required in india and industry must support you through their contributions and associations with such associations thank you very much thank this you was for we are almost yeah. like 7 minutes a concluding remark i want to give india is a country of many countries volume by large players that will apply for sandeep value by small players because if you see corona virus did not affect the people in uh, mumbai i don't want to mention where so that is a resistance by providing natural ecosystem if we take an ecosystem of sandeep that will be liquid for a large players so final one sentence for everybody protein deficiency is hitting india very 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 large सुबह दो अंडा शाम को दो अंडा हफ्ते में तीन बार मुर्गी सुबह दो अंडा शाम को दो अंडा हफ्ते में तीन बार मुर्गी फिर भी मिलेगा 50 परसेंट प्रोटीन जागो नहीं तो बहुत बहुत पस्ता होगी है ना दवा मत खाओ अंडा खाओ दवा मत खाओ अंडा खाओ थैंक यू सो मच एंड ओवर टू वर्मा जी once again uh, one announcement those who want to spot uh, registrations again the registration counter is open you can register it and uh, before uh, concluding this sessions it is time for the distribution of memento uh, those who are on online like bank and uh, salim it is uh, we already given the applause and uh, barring uh, these two persons now uh, it is a uh, time for the distribution of memento to the uh, our sandeep sir uh, i request our uh, chairman to distribute and all the members please come chairs and co chairs Uh, finally, I request uh, Dr. Jack, Dr. Jack, the President VP uh, WPA Global, felicitate the Chairman, Co-Chair, and Rapporteur. चंदनोटियर सतोष Rapporteur Jaydeep. On group photo, please. So before before breaking for the tea, uh, Dr. Anandan want to give an announcement, please. Yeah, good morning. So this is announcement regarding for uh, students. So we have a elocution competition yesterday uh, already announced. So this will be after the tea session. So all are requested to assemble there, all the students. And your uh, uh, at the assembly, whatever travel grants uh, clarifications there, it will be done there only. And based on that, we'll be processing your travel grants. So it is requested that. it will be very simple basic topics i assure that you'll really uh, you're really going to have a good fun and enjoy it thank you so please all the students assemble at 
the mini auditorium yeah others those who want to listen to the students are also welcome thank you thank you next session will start yeah, immediately after the tea break 11:15 uh, am uh, here only except the students all make assemble here please I think not much introduction need for our professor sir, the former associate dean Mumbai Veterinary College and uh, Sirwal Veterinary College. And sir is the ex um, technical advisor for various private sector companies. And also he is the Indian Poultry Association president. And about our co-chairs, Dr. Maladi. I welcome Dr. Maladi. He is a professor. He has vast experience in poultry science and more than 18 to 20 years experience. And presently, Madam is working in phytogenetics. And she has more than 30, 35 national and international publications. And the secondly, I will call on the another co-chair, Dr. Lena Bora. She is did a master's in veterinary medicine and work in various companies at various positions. Presently, she is working as Associate Director, Sales and Marketing. I will call upon our reporter, Dr. Venipi Nair. Yes, please, sir. And sir is a veterinary graduation and did the MBA from Irma. And Sar has worked in various sectors like dairy sector, poultry sector, and um, he's working as a uh, marketing sales manager, Ilanko, and for the uh, regionals, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Now, presently, he's a strategic sales advisor at uh, Kemin for India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And our uh, second uh, reporter, Dr. Um, Arun Kumar Shirwal, please welcome. He is working as an assistant professor, uh, specialist in the livestock production management and College of Veterinary Science, Bikaner. And he also worked as an officer in charge of poultry units at Bikaner. I will request our chair, Dr. Rani, sir, to take over the dice. Please. Thank you. Very good morning, everybody. The second session of the morning. I'm sure you all are fresh now after having a cup of tea or coffee. Uh, we have four speakers, and the time allotted is up to one o'clock. But I think we are 15 minutes behind schedule. We'll try to make up the time in between. Time allotted to all the speakers is about 20 minutes. So kindly follow the time limit so that I need not disturb and interrupt you. And uh, I think we'll take the questions immediately after the speaker finishes his talk, because by the time the session gets over, the questions evaporate. So better to, you know, uh, take the questions, one or two questions, important, pertinent questions immediately after the talk. So uh, I would like to invite the first speaker. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Arangaswamy is going to give the introduction of the first speaker, uh, Dr. Satyani Arora, who is going to talk on molecular diagnosis of poultry diseases the futuristic approach for next generation poultry production. Yeah. So a little brief uh, introduction about uh, Dr. Sayantani Sigi Arora. She did master, master science in molecular biology and biotechnology and PhD in biotechnology from Bose Institute of Calcutta and work as a head research laboratories in aggregate research and advice private India Private Limited. Please, madam. So hello, good morning everyone. Uh, first, I would like to say that I'm quite delighted to be a part of this knowledge transfer program. And the topic for my today's discussion is, uh, as you could see, it is a molecular diagnosis of poultry diseases. It's futuristic approach for the next gen poultry production. So starting with the topic, first 
like we all know what is if there is a disease outbreak in the flock then what should be the disease diagnosis what should be the road map so in the road map it is like when we get the information about the disease that has been occurred so first there should be an inspection like what has happened so which is going to follow by the post mortem that needs to be done and depending upon the post mortem we could go for a tentative diagnosis like we could reach to three four types of uh, diagnosis which could be interpreted from there from there the sample needs to be collected to the lab for the laboratory investigation and this will lead to a differential diagnosis so based on the differential diagnosis again it there will be a reconfirmation and finally an action plan is required since nowadays what is important it is just just not like the quantity which matters like we have a disease outbreak in our farm and we eradicated it so that is not the thing along with that what is required is an action plan a good action plan is required so instead of just eradicating the disease the action plan should be we should think of how to uh, uh, check so that the entry of the disease not occurs to our farm so a good action plan is required over there so this is a holistic approach suppose a disease outbreak is there so we go for sample collections first post mortem examination is there and then samples are being collected so from serology samples we go uh, for the serum samples we go for the serology then histology or the pathology from the tissues bacteriology or the microbiology work is being done so these will all give us a tentative diagnosis so this is where the molecular biology comes so the molecular diagnosis it appears for a much more confirmative diagnosis which we could explain which i'll be explaining in my next slides so from this type of diagnosis the reports are being submitted and from there different types of management or the treatment that could be uh, further lead to so like these are the clinical signs and symptoms which we could see like different for foul pox or the infectious coryza or for different diseases but what is required is that a knowledge about sampling that is quite important suppose in case of avian influenza so a widespread hemorrhage occurs throughout the body so the veterinarian or the person who is dealing with that in the lab he should he or she should be knowing like which sample to collect from there so if for like avian influenza is there so i don't know but i am seeing hemorrhages throughout the body so if i take the samples from the abdominal fat then i won't result in some positive uh, infection so the results will be uh, negative so for that specific uh, samples like from the trachea or the respiratory tract these types of information so the veterinarian should have that proper information for the sample collection so these are the normal uh, techniques or the conventional techniques that we are following like serum monitoring is playing a huge role so what we get or what we could uh, identify from these uh, histograms is that norm we practice it like that that if the histograms are in between the curve then we interpret it as there is no infection however the histograms if they have been shifted towards the right then we uh, from there we indicate that there must be some field infections that have occurred so like this is the case of ibv then again in case of ndv also these types of uh, uh, interpretations we could get from there but what happens is serum monitoring it has few drawbacks few drawbacks in the sense while interpreting first of all we need to know about the full history of the flock that is about its vaccination that high titer whether it is due to the infection or whether it is due to the vaccination from serology we can't interpret to it then we need to know about the history of the flock like whether it has been exposed to some disease or some treatments were there so that information needs to be taken then again like theoretically it is being said for a good diagnosis if you need to do using serum monitoring at least 5 to 10% of your total flock size it should be taken as samples 
So suppose if you have a, a, like a big flock, 10,000 fl uh, birds flock is there, then the 5%, it will be a huge number to be tested in the lab to reach to a conclusive uh, interpretation. Then the third thing is how the interpretation is done. I being a lab technician, I'll be interpreting it in a different way, whereas some other veterinarian, he will be interpreting it in a different way. So interpretation also varies from one person to another. Next thing is for sero, sero monitoring, like we can't, it is not applicable to uh, bacterial diseases, mainly it, it is for the viral diseases as there. And the th last one is that sero monitoring is not a direct uh, like uh, thing for uh, it is not a direct test it is an indirect test that is we are measuring the antibody that is being exposed by the birds so it also depends upon birds to birds next is another conventional diagnosis that is the microbiology diagnosis is also being used in our lab but we will be surprised or we might be knowing that out of the total 99% of the bacteria which are known we are hardly able to culture 1% of them, or we just know 1% of them. So what about the others? They could also infect. Like nowadays, uh, in last uh, one decade, like before that, CAV was not much familiar, but now we are getting CAV. So that could not be identified from the microbiological techniques. So from there comes the, uh, the drawbacks of this conventional diagnosis. That is, it is based on the traditional culture techniques. One more thing is that microbiology, it can't differentiate between the pathogenic or the apathogenic. Like, we will be getting, suppose we need to uh, check for the E. coli. So on the plates, we will be getting positive E. coli colonies. But whether that E. coli is harmful for my bird or not, whether it is avian pathogenic E. coli or not, from microbiology, we can't distinguish. So this distinguish between the pathogenic and the apathogenic, microbiology is not able to solve. So these limitations and the biasedness that are coming from the traditional techniques or the uh, microbiological techniques, they can be overcome by metagenomics. So metagenomics is what we could say that it is in a broader sense, it is the, commu uh, the community genomics of the total microbe that is there inside the bird. So leading to these conventional disease diagnostic tools which have some limitations, there comes the molecular diagnosis. And like the molecular diagnosis, it is the ultimate truth and it is basically it is a paradigm shift of diagnostic methods of the poultry disease diagnostics nowadays. So in this molecular approach, a molecular diagnosis approach, what is happening is that it is detecting the specific nucleic acids from the samples and which leads molecular diagnosis to be like it is very sensitive, but instead of sensitive, I would like to say it is truly sensitive and it is a truly specific methodology that could be done. And another advantage is that like the samples can be environmental or any biological materials could be used. And with the invention of or with the incoming of these FTA cards, which are nowadays use, we are using, so the transfer of the samples is also quite uh, easy, like we need not maintain the cold chains, so sample putrefaction or the sample getting destroyed, that factor is not there. And simply we could just, no technician, special technician is required, like anyone could just, in your farm, anyone could just take a swab, rub it on the FTA cards, and they could just send the samples to a distant lab, wherever the molecular diagnosis is taking place. So these things are making uh, the molecular diagnosis approach an easier technique or a reachable technique for all the people who are being involved in the poultry farm. So how the traditional uh, versus the molecular diagnosis, it is advantageous is it is saving time for us. Like what happens in the traditional diagnosis, whenever we are getting the clinical signs and the symptoms, 
we go for according to the signs and symptoms we are going for the serum monitoring accordingly from the serum monitoring results we are moving towards the vaccinations then even vaccination if there are mortality we are moving towards the post mortem then from the samples we are uh, going for the microbiological test still we are unable to reach any specific diagnosis like what we are reaching is a non specific a tentative diagnosis could be done from there on the other hand when it is a molecular diagnosis if we are getting the clinical signs and symptoms molecular diagnosis will lead to the precision diagnosis this will save time because when you are having symptoms so according to your knowledge you will just be collecting the samples and whatever the diseases that we could interpret at that time so instead of just applying the vaccinations or then post mortem then collecting the samples we could just go for the tissue collections or the sample collections and from there we could go to the molecular diagnosis and which will give us a precision diagnosis on the other hand like molecular diagnosis will also be cost efficient and cost efficient it is like when there is a non specific tentative disease diagnosis is there so we will deploy the corrective actions for all those uh, diseases or the non specific diseases the tentative disease diagnosis which has been done so for that we will be deploying the corrective action in the meantime we will be deploying my total flock there will be a drop in the performance so once there is a drop in the performance we will be applying medicines we will be applying vaccines which will again increase the cost and this will lead to uncontrolled mortality and finally my profitability will be hit but when there is a precision diagnosis so at the beginning only you are getting a precise information that yes this is the disease which has affected my flock so at that time you could go for a faster corrective action and this faster corrective action the performance will be well built up in the flock so there will be lower medicine cost lower vaccination cost will be there mortality of my flock will be under the control and expected profitability will be there so this is how molecular diagnosis will save both time and it will result in profitability also so uh, these are like few molecular diagnoses that have been done so the first one is like the it was a viral disease uh, detection that was done using pcr so as i told that the information about the specific sample it needs to the veterinarian has to have that information so liver samples were taken according to the symptoms which were seen and from there it was uh, diagnosed that ibh is there so along with ibh we could also distinguish which type of ibh was there whether it was 8a 8b 11 or any other type so that distinguish we could also distinguish that thing or we could detect that thing so when we are getting the specific type like the ibh 8a accordingly we could uh, protect our flock the another one that is the it was for the detection of uh, avian pathogenic e coli which i was telling like in the microbiology uh, section we will be getting positive e coli colonies but whether to act over it or not so that needs a further confirmation so for that like different virulent genes are there which is making an e coli to a avian pathogenic e coli so if after the uh, positive colonies that we are getting in the microbiology lab if we further go for the molecular diagnosis so from there if we are getting those virulent genes that is the fem c iucd pap c and numerous numerous other virulent genes are there so if we get those genes are positive in our test then we need to uh, work upon it like my flock or uh, the environment it is not affected just by e coli i have to act upon it it is an avian pathogenic e coli so this uh, confirmation could be done using molecular diagnosis that was which i showed earlier it was from the pcr technique that could be done and this one is the disease detection using the real time pcr technique so if 
I want to like not just present or absent matters. What matters is how much quantity quantification also matters. So for getting the quantification, we uh, could go for like this was a test where respiratory infections were reported by the farmer. So what was advised was IBV along with that IRT and NDV because they all will lead to some respiratory symptoms and infections. It could happen. So there. IBV, uh, the real-time PCR was done. It was also similar to PCR, but it is a quantitative PCR. And from there, we could found that this IBV 4 by 91, it was showing the lowest CT value. Like after COVID, we all know the lower the CT value, we are more F prone to that viral disease. The viral load is more. So similarly, in this one, the lowest CT value was observed in this 30, uh, IBV 4 by 91, which was also visible from this uh, graph, which is machine generated. So what happens is that we all have that um, a vaccine blanket is always given. Suppose uh, my flock, the vaccine companies come and they will give us a vaccine a blanket over it. So I could at that time, I could say that I don't need a vaccine against IBV Massachusetts uh, variety or IBV D274 or ILT because the, the CT values are high. So the infection is not due to that. But my the specific concern is all about IBV 4 by 91. So give me a vaccine which will protect my flock against IBV 4 by 91. So in that case, I could assure I could assure my farm that I'm saving I'm getting the right vaccine I'm not just overloading my birds with the vaccines and I'm also saving the money so this is how uh, this real time PCR or the qPCR it could add value more to the results then this is the sequencing of the PCR product like when to go for it suppose I got a positive, this was a case when uh, we got a sample and it was uh, NDV positive. So then uh, we went for further sequencing to understand because he uh, has, uh, the farmer has vaccinated his flock against NDV. So if NDV is, uh, he was vaccinated against it, then how we are getting the NDV positive in the gel. So at that time, further sequencing was done. And these are the chromatograms that we normally get. From there, the sequence is being derived. And from the, uh, like in the NCBI database, after that sequence was blasted over there, a homology was found with the NDV uh, strain, that is the Lasota strain. So the fusion protein, which was uh, amplified in the PCR uh, agarose gel, it was not an infection, but his vaccinated strain was there, which was working properly. So that, uh, confusion could be misled from there. We could uh, remove that confusion from there. Or suppose if other case would have happened that he had vaccinated, but it is not showing any homology with the Lasota strain and some other strain was there, then the farmer needs to be wakened up and he needs to work upon it like my vaccination, the vaccination which I have applied, either the procedure was not correctly given, it was not correctly given, or it has, it is not working properly. So I need to give some other measures. So after sequencing, they could confirm between whether the positive product that I'm getting, whether it is from the vaccinated or it is from some other infection, some un unknown other infection that has affected my flocks. So uh, this is another one that is uh, DIVA-PCR, which is a differentiation between the vaccinated and the infected strains. So whether my flock is uh, like when we are going for testing, so after that, whether my flock is infected or the results which I'm getting, it is due to the vaccination. So the difference between the two, the infected and the vaccination flock, that could also easily be done using the molecular diagnosis. So you could see in every sense, it will be a more precision diagnosis will be uh, there, which I mentioned earlier also, and it will be a time-saving uh, diagnosis. So um, after uh, those PCR and the real-time PCR, all the PCR techniques, 
Next was comes is that there is a high throughput next generation sequencing. That is, uh, three types of uh, sequencing, next generation sequencing are there. That is a chromatin immunoprecipitation coupled to a DNA microarray, which is a protein DNA interaction. So from this protein DNA interaction also, it is the next generation sequencing, which in poultry we are nowadays following. Then we could also go for the RNA sequencing, and finally, which is the whole genome sequencing. So this whole genome sequencing, it is the microbiome sequencing via this high throughput next generation sequencing. And nowadays in poultry, this is uh, coming to be a viable tool for assessing the composition of the bacteria. Like we know in case of poultry or in any human being, a good gut health means a good uh, broiler or a good layer, anything is just related to the gut. So if we are uh, uh, knowing about the microbiome of the gut, from there we could in future resist about the diseases. This WGS, it is um, gaining an importance. As I told that it has an epidemiological investigation, it is helping in it. And then it informs about the total phylogeny of whichever pathogenic organisms or the bacteria we are getting. So the whole information could be done. And this WGS, it also helps in the surveillance of the AMR, which is a hot topic nowadays. So that AMR could also be done. So these uh, are just the two examples of the WGS that was done. So it was just a control bar where the total uh, bacterial species and all, they were just identified. And from there, we could know as bacteroides is a good bacteria, it is known as. So how from negative control, when the probiotic was added to the birds for the, uh, instead of antibiotics, when the probiotics were given, how the birds bacteroids composition, it increased. So finally, we could summarize like in various molecular diagnosis, it should be adapted even in the uh, small laboratories and especially where fastidious pathogens like the MG or MS, which are hard to culture in the microbiology lab. So there we could go for the molecular diagnosis. This will give lead us to the confirmative results that will save time as well as uh, money. And the sequenced based technology, it will provide us with more and more knowledge about discovering more genes or the various pathways that could enhance the understanding of the poultry pathogens. This is all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arora. Nice presentation. Actually, we come from the era when poultry disease diagnosis was restricted to only four things. Age of the bird, mortality pattern, postmortem lesions, and if required, the lab diagnosis. Lab but diagnosis. as you rightly pointed out, in those days, lab diagnosis used to take a lot of time, and uh, the flock uh, couldn't wait for that. Yeah. Uh, the advantages of you know the modern technology which you have described are very nice. Uh, entire talk was self-explanatory. Still, if some, somebody has any questions, kindly, if pertinent questions are there, they are welcome. Yes, please. She mentioned about the economic aspect. It is it is economical, but I think she will explain more about it. Yeah. It is uh, not like one sample. Definitely, few samples needs to be taken because for statistically, if we want to uh, represent the whole flock, so few samples like at least from a flock, four to five samples will need to be taken. It will represent, it could represent. Yes, Dr. Kurkure, yeah, please. Sure. It's not only the cost of test. It is the how much money you saved after the precise and correct diagnosis yeah. as early as possible. That is the, she has mentioned it, but it is not only the cost of test. It is the money you saved by correct diagnosis. That yeah, that's what I mentioned. If yeah. there is a tentative diagnosis, we will be focusing more on other things. Okay, last question. Dr. Bora has some. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Dr. Sayantani, thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you. Rightly uh, highlighted the 
fact that correct samples need to be taken from the correct areas and also in a correct medium for proper molecular diagnosis. My question is, uh, you mentioned that you can actually differentiate between the field strain and the yeah. vaccine strain. My question is on that. How exactly? Because uh, uh, my experience is that it becomes a little difficult to differentiate between the field strain and the vaccine strain. You mentioned 4191 mm -hmm. or in cases of Marex, for example. So how do you exactly differentiate between the field strain and the vaccine strain? Like it could be, as I mentioned, one technique was there that is the DIVA PCR, which is differentiating between the vaccinated and the infected strain. So what happens is that for that, we need the information about the vaccine, which was designed on what gene it was designed. So accordingly from there, specific primers are designed and which is different from the wild type. So that vaccinated portion from the same area, the infected portion, also the primers are designed and different probes are given. That is also done through the real-time PCR. So different probes are applied to them. And what will happen is in the vaccinated strain, I will be having my wild-type blocker will be there. The wild-type blocker probe will be there. So it will, if there is wild-type infection, I'll be getting different results. Like the vaccinated one will show the results. And the same sample will also be checked with the wild-type uh, uh, probe and the vaccinated blocker. So these blockers, they will just reduce my background. So from there, I'll be getting the quantitative values will be, uh, I'll be getting where it is about whether the flock is being vaccinated, the specific probe will get the results about it, and whether it is uh, the infected one or the non-vaccinated one. So this is how we could differentiate between the two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Can we have the second speaker, please? Thank you. We call upon our second speaker, my respected senior doctor, the chief technical officer in Intel, what's that? Insulus in Biosolutions India Private Limited, India, and uh, working on even disease control and vaccine and diagnostic area. Please, sir. Yeah, you can start, sir. Prithviraj Kumar is going to talk on uh, inclusion body hepatitis, which is a big problem nowadays, especially in our area, and understanding the landscape, current scenario, and strategic control program in India. Problems of inclusion body hepatitis, where we, find, we found uh, typical mortality in broilers were around uh, three weeks onwards. The mortality goes up to 30 to 40 percent. And that was the time like no vaccine was available. We know that the disease was first identified in uh, Pakistan, a place called Angaragod. They, that's why it's called as Angara disease. Then in India, the type uh, four also, uh, the, the heart uh, resembles lychee fruit. Then uh, that's why they called us uh, lychee disease in India. And this was uh, mainly transmitted by vertical as well as horizontal, but the more dangerous thing is vertical disease. When the parents are infected, you expect almost 150 progeny is going to be affected. So uh, the control program started at the vaccination vaccination of parents, then they uh, reduced or they controlled the problems. Right? And there is, there is also been uh, precipitated by other factors we know about chicken anemia and IBD. That time, uh, chicken anemia was not uh, prevalent. IBD was the one major thing which caused the problem, which precipitated the disease. And that was the time we also had very virulent IBD in India. So, in nutshell, that IB, uh, IBH4, or we call this lychee disease, which was uh, present during the uh, 90s, which typically shown uh, hydroperigardium. Just we do postmortem, we see that hydroperigardium, then we simply declare it as a leachy disease. And some cases we found hepatitis, and there was no involvement of kidneys. And uh, this was easy to diagnose during those days. And the, the disease was mainly from, as I mentioned, that it was oral and uh, fecal route, uh, horizontal transmission or vertical transmission. This vertical transmission was uh, very uh, dangerous in this case, where uh, the, the mortality goes up to 30% in case of broilers. 
being adenovirus it was very easy to control uh, put in generating immune response we in the laboratory we are normally we see that within 10 days of vaccination we get around 100 percent of protection whether the antibodies are there or not we get protection around 100 percent in case of adenovirus so what happened uh, we started traditional inactivated vaccines we had uh, inactivated vaccines initially it was produced using uh, liver homogenates which was working well and the advantage with this it was safety and cost saving that the scaling up was very easy we can vaccinate around uh, thousands of birds in uh, or we can produce vaccine in large quantities uh, within very short period and this also gives very good, uh, good uh, femoral immunity this antibody produced by this adenovirus uh, are very fast and very quick and they were able to control the disease and this also reduced the influence of maternal antibodies we know that maternal antibodies interfere with the vaccines mainly live vaccines whereas in case of inactivated vaccines because of their release for the prolonged period we find uh, they overcome uh, the maternal antibody level and we find 100 percent protection initially we in india we started vaccinating the commercial uh, broilers but we understood that once you vaccinate the parents around the uh, 12th week and 18th week and we are able to give uh, confer or uh, protection to the progeny besides that high level of antibodies in parents they also reduce the vertical transmission this by, by this we are able to control inclusion body hepatitis caused by type 4 uh, very easily i think after 2000 2001 we have not seen any ibh problems in india but suddenly somewhere around 2013 we find similar problems we found uh, hepatitis uh, hepatitis as well as jaundice liver and the liver was uh, quite enlarged compared to type 4 infection whereas the heart the fluid accumulation in the heart was missing the difference between uh, ibh 4 infection and other infections like a11 or type 8b the difference lies in fluid accumulation in the heart the fluid accumulation here is uh, kind of copious like in case of type 4 even if you cut open this pericardial sac the gel will still lie on the liver uh, on the uh, heart it will not diffuse whereas in this case like any acute disease like if you see any foul cholera or any other bacterial disease the fluid was very copious or very little fluid and when you cut open it will diffuse that was the differential or major differential uh, diagnosis at this time but still we found inclusion bodies in the livers and uh, uh, kidneys the other in uh, interesting factor is the kidneys the involvement of kidneys the kidneys are uh, pronounced and there were complete jaundice when you open uh, the uh, skin itself you will find pronounced jaundice yellow color uh, all over the body there was this striking difference and we were able to do a uh, pcr and with that uh, we can, the pcr was mainly targeted for hexon pro gene of uh, ib uh, inclusion uh, foul adenovirus with this we were able to identify type 11 there were some cases of uh, type 2 but when we started detection uh, the, the over the period we found type 4 was uh, more prevalent at the same time we still we detect type 4 infections in breeders as older birds it is surprising that we were seen in uh, we have uh, all, all over the period we have studied that ibh 4 infection of uh, leech disease is seen only between uh, 3 to 6 weeks but we have seen even up to 10 weeks in case of breeders and we found that those breeders were not vaccinated with type 4 vaccine and uh, that's why we found uh, for type 4 so this thing and there is an emergence of type 11 infection in india around uh, 13 isolates during that uh, period were uh, sequenced and we found all these were sitting between type 11 and uh, uh, type 2 and uh, if you uh, look into this uh, classification we normally we take ictv classifications the all this uh, belongs to uh, different uh, species if i go back to my uh, previous slide about avian adenovirus in uh, this thing this avian adenovirus they are uh, classified into five uh, species based on the restriction enzyme analysis like uh, uh, a b c d e there are five species and when we do this uh, cross neutralization or uh, virus neutralization test they are further divided into 12 uh, serotypes the one 
which was uh, seen, uh, which was causing lichen disease, predominantly type 4 in India. And the uh, similar uh, type 10 was uh, re reported somewhere in Mexico. But the disease was restricted to India, Pakistan, and Iran, and Mexico. The disease was not spreading to other, other areas. Whereas in US and Canada and Australia, during that time, they found type 8 and 8B, which were more of uh, hepatitis. They don't cause any hydropericardium syndrome. And this was the case. Only these uh, two uh, uh, type C and type E were prevalent. But later, uh, this 9 and 11 was initially reported in uh, South American countries, in Chile and Peru. Then it was reported in Thailand, uh, Indonesia, then in India. Around 2000, now if you look into this, the prevalence is there in the entire uh, the thing. This was the uh, uh, picture of uh, type 4, and later we'll uh, talk about type 11. So as I said that many of the isolates were uh, found to be type 11, and uh, these isolates were also being sequenced, and we found uh, there is a, a clear difference between uh, uh, the similarities between uh, different species. Within the species, if you say that type uh, uh, species D, the difference is hardly uh, 5 to 10 percent, whereas between uh, species, the difference is around uh, 40 percent. Another thing in case of uh, type 11 or uh, type 8, there is no uh, proper challenge model. If you take type 4, if you infect the birds, there will be 100 percent mortality if they don't have antibodies. Whereas in case of type 8 and 11, the mortality is very, very less, or sometimes you don't find any mortalities. But we find the difference in mean anti uh, antibodies or mean body weight. The, the development of or uh, the growth all will be affected by type 11. And we find some changes in the liver. And with this, they have been identified this, uh, or they have been concluded that this virus is not just causing uh, mortality, but is it become a metabolically important disease. And there were reports that uh, the infected birds had uh, hypoglycemia and uh, low level of calcium. So initial attempts were uh, made with uh, type 11 uh, autogenous vaccine. And it was uh, uh, taken to the field where we found the difference, but difference of uh, almost uh, 50 points in case of uh, economic parameters, the mortality itself uh, around 5% uh, uh, reduction. Earlier it was around 20% that uh, we have seen up to 20%, but in this case, the comparison, you signed around 11% mortality in unvaccinated flock, whereas the vaccinated flock with uh, F11, type 11 antigen, uh, uh, type 11 uh, autogenous vaccine, the mortality was able to reduce to 6%, which was almost near normal to the birds. So this was the initial uh, uh, experience with uh, type 11. With that, we found that the, it's a, one of the emerging diseases in India in Indian uh, 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 context. But we also found that there was no mortality in the SPF birds. We are not able to reproduce the birds in terms of mortality. And, but it, uh, it exhibits as a metabolic disease. There was a extensive damage to the liver and pancreas because of that hypoglycemia and uh, hypocalcemia was the major reason. And uh, now the uh, type 4 and 11 uh, combined uh, infection is present not just in India. You will find uh, entire Asian countries, also Mexico and North uh, uh, South American uh, countries. We find this problem is prevalent. Remaining areas still US, uh, US and Canada, then again Brazil and Australia still they have type 80 as a prevalent disease. So what is the best control uh, program for type 11 infection? because it is not causing problem in uh, laying birds. Because we must understand that the, the growth pattern of broilers and uh, are layers, laying birds are entirely different. And the metabol because of that, adenovirus as such not affecting much in case of uh, layers. We find there is a resistance in uh, laying, uh, laying birds. So in case of uh, broiler parents, we started vaccinating around 12th, 18th and uh, 45 weeks. Three times we started vaccinating those uh, parents, which gives, uh, which uh, prevent the vertical transmission, also gives sufficient metal antibodies during first uh, three or four weeks of age. Thereby, there, there is a reduction of uh, mortality in case of uh, commercial broilers. But this metal antibodies, they are not able to protect for the longer period. We know that 
metal antibodies do they have a, uh, do they have a half life, half life in case of broilers they are as early as possible as early as 3 to 3 and a half days so even <coughs> with very high metal antibody levels during vulnerable period between uh, june and october the vaccine is not able to protect so progeny day old chicks also has been vaccinated during this period we know that this is the period where um, toxin levels and ibd also having uh, uh, the commonly seen in the birds and because of that we do vaccinate the progeny during th this period now if you look into the recent developments there are uh, two developments hap uh, happen uh, in uh, combined vaccines because recently in china uh, they were experiencing type 4 earlier they had only type 8 and 11 and they started a recombinant vaccine targeting fiber proteins like this fiber proteins uh, also uh, part of your uh, new, they, they produce neutralizing antibodies they are responsible for attachment of the virus to the cells so with this they uh, if uh, adenovirus 4 is a backbone they had uh, 8b and 11 uh, insert they had and they they found that there is a mortality there is a 100% protection in case of uh, type 4 and again in case of 8b and uh, 811 there is a reduction in virus shedding or the the prevalence the uh, virus shedding in 8b and 811 also possible similarly there was a inactivated uh, adenovirus vaccine uh, they also in, in uh, uh, korea they found that the by just giving type 4 they mentioned that uh, type 8 a and 11 also been protected but uh, this is again a big question mark whereas in our context you are not able to see the cross protection between type 4 and uh, type 11. this was the experiment when we were uh, vaccinating with uh, uh, in a small trial when we did vaccinate broilers with uh, type uh, 4 to type 4 and uh, type 11 vaccination vaccination but this is not a challenge trial it's a field trial there was a reduction in mortality between uh, type 11 vaccinated birds and other birds. So if you see the mortality, uh, controlled birds with type 4, uh, 4 vaccinated birds, there was a no reduction in mortality. The mortality was as high as, as, high as controlled, whereas type 11 vaccinated birds, there is a reduction in mortality. This indicates there is no cross protection, or the, even if there is a cross protection, it is not sufficient, only partially uh, existing. And uh, if you see the normal mortality in this case is only 3.5%. Whereas in typical uh, 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 the inclusion body hepatitis or IBH infection, we find mortality is around 10 to 15%. So these births are apparently normal, healthy, but even then the reduction of almost 2% mortality. This is probably because of control in immunosuppression. We already know, whereas we know that they're one of the major cause of immunosuppression along with uh, IBD and CAV. The, when we give this uh, adenovirus vaccine in broilers, there is a sufficient protection against immunosuppression uh, that will help the birds in uh, protecting adenovirus infection. This is all our experience in uh, adenovirus vaccination in India. We know that this will be the major uh, problem, not in just India, but uh, the, the almost entire Asia is uh, reeling with uh, type 11 as well as type 8 infection. We should be uh, probably the next stage like that vaccination will be the one of the important method to control because uh, this is disease is uh, uh, mainly vertically transmitted by vaccinating the parents who will be able to control to the progeny okay. thank you thank you, thank you dr Puthiraj. excellent you have maintained thank the time very well thank you <laughs> again there's a beauty of science you know every day newer and newer information is being added uh, like as i said earlier uh, Angara disease, Vichy disease, IBH, all was considered one and same because this differentiation in the types was not available. But as uh, more information is being added, now we can see that uh, what's the difference, which vaccine will work for which particular strain. Uh, that's the beauty of it. Uh, thank you very much. If uh, somebody has any questions, Dr. Manjunath, please. Having uh, uh given to the farm around 50 farms let us say and the same feed is given but it is seen in few farms it is not seen in many farms it is pretty confusing what do you comment on that 
did i communicate to you properly yeah, i got i got it uh, probably uh, the age of the breeders that's one factor uh, i i'm not sure like whether uh, the particular uh, age of the, the same lot of eggs goes to the different flock many times what happen in hatchery they are mixing different age groups okay so the parents with younger age group probably they are recently vaccinated they have very high maternal antibodies they were able to protect the birds from the progeny from the older birds around 60 or 60 weeks if they don't practice midly they will have a very low maternal antibodies so those birds probably they have the few farms it is seen typical like they had okay some inclusions are seen and kidney swellings are seen okay and many farms it is not seen at all okay probably this could be the reason or maybe the uh, uh, co infection with uh, ibd or mycotoxins that the also IBD can be good doctor yes doctor uh thanks dr prithviraj uh, it's not a question i was just uh, a thought process i wanted to share uh, see the ib nephro it causes a overlapping you know postmortem uh, changes and the period of infection is very also interesting here that it starts by day 8 sometime day 11 day 12 for ib nephro and as it starts subsiding many times there's a confusion whether it is ib nephro or ibh and the progression of the disease continues like that like ibn afro subsides again suddenly the mortality start increasing so uh, this is not a question by the way i just wanted to have your thought process and just you if if you echo the same uh, uh, thing with me and uh, that could also lead this kind of confusion that uh, you have some cases of ibh and uh, and you somewhere you case you see cases of ibn afro and you misdiagnose as uh, ibh so yeah no, probably uh, i will like to uh, dive, dive deep into this whether it is a I, you mean ib nephro or ib as uh, astro virus infection okay okay yep yep yeah i do not see any correlation between uh, i like nephropathy or uh, uh, the inclusion body hepatitis because to the mechanism is entirely different here we talk morely most about uh, vertical transmitted disease dr amar okay we have little shortage of time last question please Uh, the effect on the bursa has also a role to play because hepatitis is ubiquitous and it is seen as a of the uh, extended skin of immunosuppressed true doctor like yeah immunosuppressant caused by intermediate plus vaccines yes so again we come to the basics doctor we have to be very particular about you know the management nutrition etc uh, quite a good number of hepatoprotective agents are now available using them regularly at a proper dosage is something would help of course besides choline chloride there is hardly anything which we can use but we can go back to herbals the way it is being used in human beings and we can protect the liver so that these type of complications will not reach anyway thank you very much dr prithviraj thank you sir uh, can we have a next speaker please call upon the next speaker dr susim mukulre is post graduate of polity professor and uh, had a gold medalist having expertise in the field of veterinary microbiology and vaccinology he has been industry expert in oasis project and presently is working the project and project leader microbiome innovation for screening and isolation of novel probiotic strains author 10 national and international publication please mukul So thank you very much a uh, very good afternoon to everyone and i would like to start with uh, by thanking the organizer of WBPA India 2024 for giving me this opportunity and especially Dr Jitendra Bharma sir i think i am not seeing here and uh, for his for being kind enough so the topic we going to uh, discuss is kind of large topic and very important and uh, i am privileged to uh, 
to to bring this or volunteer this uh, need of characterization of probiotic strains in uh, poultry healthcare sector. So I'll try to finish uh, within the time um, as brief as possible and touch upon some of the relevant slides and explain. So the topic outline would be a start with the definition of probiotic that was unanimously given by the FAO and WHO. Then we'll talk about the modification in the definition of probiotics and why it was done. And the main, uh, uh, you know, the objective of this entire uh, keynote presentation is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, underpinned by the second outline, talk outline. Third would be the strain identification. We'll talk about some typing methods being used and uh, what is the gold standard. And then we'll come to the concept of probiotic application in poultry and uh, how it is looked into uh, by our farming community as well as from, as I'm representing Zenex Animal Health here from the healthcare company like us, how we look into probiotic application. Then we'll see into the review of literature on the application of probiotics. Then we'll touch upon a model that would describe how to approach uh, isolation selection of novel strain uh, from the chicken gastrointestinal tract, and then we conclude. So the definition of probiotic, you can see uh, it was unanim unanimously given by FAO and WHO in 2001 that it's a live microorganism, which when given in adequate amount, confer health benefit to the host. So three key words, live, it should be given in adequate amount and should confer health benefit no ambiguity in this definition. But the next very year, you can see a joint working committee of FAO and WHO had proposed certain prerequisites to call any microbial strain as a probiotic. What are these prerequisites? So they wanted some modification. This is not as simple as it was uh, proposed in 2001. The first thing they asked for assessment of the probiotic up to the strain level. So it's genus, species, and then strain. Strains are individual within the species. Then they asked for doing in vitro tests to identify certain quality because all probiotics meant for a particular host require different qualities. It is not that a probiotic that is for, for example, poultry would be same would should should have same characteristics that can that can you know meet the requirement for the other host or particular you know purpose like for pharmaceutical use so in vitro tests were you know recommended to be done which could uh, uh, you know fulfill the objective for the intended purpose of use then assessment of safety which was very important. And it was identified that certain probiotics, so-called probiotic species, the strains within the species might have some safety issues, which we'll highlight in the next few slides, need to be assessed. The fourth one is to validate whatever findings you get in in vitro through field trials, whether you are really getting or all the in vitro tests are translating to the in vivo results. So uh, the next few slides, I'll talk about what could have led to this kind of modification in definition. So first thing, it was highlighted. And also, I, you can see uh, this is uh, data from our uh, finding laboratory studies that we have done. That, And of course, there are many scientific evidences supporting this fact that the, species, the strains within the species have wide variation. They're interspecific capabilities or phenotypic expression, like enzyme expression, anti-inflammatory property, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to know which particular strain we are using, um, and we need to identify whether it is fit for that intended purpose of use or not. Second is, again, some of the properties, like anti-infective property. This is, uh, you, know, can, you can see we have done a plate antagonism assay, which could show that the different strains within a particular species while showing different zone of inhibitions again a against a same pathogen, an E. coli isolate, uh, ATCC uh, isolate of uh, E. coli. This is again Staphylococcus aureus, methicillin resistant, a same 
uh, species but different strains while showing different zone of inhibition inhibition against one the previous one was was against a gram negative bacteria this was again a gram positive bacteria then second point that was very important it was the safety issues so safety issue the first two things that need to be uh, you know identified is the hemolytic activity and cytotoxic activity which is very important because some strains of lab bacteria were shown to pr produce a uh, cytotoxic effect in H2, HT29 cell line or CACO2 cell, cell line, which, which uh, triggered this concept that the strains within a species, which otherwise are considered to be a good probiotic candidate, might have some cytotoxicity issue, toxicity issue. Then third, the AMR. Some of the strains have been shown to harbor AMR genes and they are thought to transfer it horizontally to other harmful pathogens and may spread antimicrobial resistance. And fourth, the putative virulence factors across certain species, I'm not talking about strains, across certain species, which again can go up to the strain level because still many research studies are going on. For example, enterococcus species having fecalis and fischium, they have a lot of difference. Fecalis is used in food industry but it harbors a lot of pathogenicity islands, more than 100 KB gene sequence. So this putative virulent gene sequence should be mapped and should not be used as a probiotic. Otherwise, the species has been qualified to be considered as a probiotic candidate. Third, very interesting. This is due to lack of complete characterization of the probiotic. Certain probiotic products I'm not mentioned because of conflict of interests. It is published. I can name the product name because it has been published. Passive floor, uh, it's a human probiotic, and we don't have much data on the animal uh, healthcare sector, but the references are available for human probiotic, where passive floor is a product in European Union, which claimed to have Bacillus subtilis, but in the long run, it was found that it is causing nosocomial infection endocarditis, and it was found that the composition had Bacillus serious spores, which was containing enterotoxigenic genes. And it is because of serious lack of characterization. The label claim differed from actual composition. So which need, that, that's the reason we need this modification. This uh, slide, we now move, move to the next topic is about strain identification and typing method. Now this typing method characterization doesn't exist in our, in, in that serious way or religiously being done in our sector. Even in the human sector, like 20 years back, it was not uh, manda uh, mandatory. Like, as you can see, the definition came after 2000, 2001, 2002. Why this has happened? Because we are using probiotic through, the use of probiotic is dead back to the use of yogurt card. And this thing is something like, uh, uh, you know, a legacy becomes more, become greater than the scientific facts. So we didn't feel it necessary since we're using card and yogurt for so long time, we didn't feel it necessary that whether this probiotic could even have a harmful effects. So no characterization were done uh, till 2000s or the necessity of characterization was not talked about. But later on, since we moved from that yogurt application to particular pharmaceutical biotherapeutic application, like for treating diabetes, treating, you know, uh, in our Gidus Research Center, we, de we developed certain probiotic. I worked with the team to uh, uh, treat urinary tract infection using a lactobacillus strain. They characterized it. So that is a specific biopharmaceutical application for treating inflammatory bile disease syndrome. So when your application becomes so pinpoint, narrow down, you are narrowing down the application, it requires proper typing and characterization. And Nowadays, large-scale multi-species formulations are available, and manufacturers cannot characterize all these species. You see, number of lists of probiotic species mentioned in the product, and it is impossible for a manufacturer to do the, all the characterization work. So for this, uh, some of the characterization methods are, <clears throat> or typing methods are recommended by various research workers. I'm not going deep into that. It's mentioned in the Sovnir. You can go through, and also many publications are available. But I would like to touch upon that till date, whole genome sequencing with in silico analysis or DNA-DNA reassociation is considered to be the gold standard. Even not the complete 
16S ribosomal RNA sequencing is considered to be the method to confirm uh, a species in a probiotic because there are lack of data in the public database. Now coming to the concept of probiotic application in poultry. In poultry, probiotic application has been more than 50 years or so. But there is a pub, I mean, I'm not uh, mentioned it here, but just want to uh, mention, I mean, talk about it. That uh, a publication was there in the year 1971 by Nurmi and Rantala, who first bought this concept of comp competitive exclusion. Probably that is the, the first published data that was available, where they tried to control a Salmonella infantis infection using probiotic lactobacilli. They failed. Then they showed that using the microflora of a healthy chicken gut, unmanipulated microflora, they could make the flock resistant to Salmonella infantis infection. And that was probably the first published data that showed how gut microflora can prevent the uh, infection from challenges or maintain uh, gut health. Then Fuller and further adapted by Kabir et al. I took it from there. It's just beautiful representation of probiotic application where it shows on the left hand side of the arc that in wild, uh, sorry, in the right hand side of the arc, there are wild birds which uh, remain in contact with their offspring, natural brooding. They are well protected. Whereas our commercially rear bird, they are separated from their parents. They cannot come in, with their, come in contact with the natural flora. So there is a gap. So we need to fulfill and simulate essentially what is happening in the wild by you know, transferring that protective flora. Here are some research reviews from last 50 years. Many references, I could cite some. So if you see the outcome of probiotic application in poultry, you would see that there are three outcomes. Either it can significantly improve the production performance, or there are minimal improvement, which is not statistically significant. Again, even negative results have been cited compared to a control. So these inconsistent results does not you know, comply with the definition of probiotic, that it should always confer health benefits. So we uh, approached a model or I would like to share with you a model where we approached uh, probiotic uh, strain identification selection from healthy chicken gut based on four criteria: safety profile of the strain, stability and viability, performance parameters, and anti-infective profiling. So already uh, the background I already mentioned. One I like to highlight is the increasing pressure of restriction of MFAs on countries like us. And I have also worked with a, on a project of uh, antimicrobial stewardship in society two years back. And they are really vocal about uh, using or finding an alternative to antibiotics or AGPs. We uh, published uh, not the full paper, but part of the work in recently concluded WBPA in 22nd of uh, 22nd WBPA in Verona, Italy where we could identify a novel strain, Bacillus CMNC ZMT02. We had some other strains also in the pipeline, just I'll show you in forthcoming slides. So the, the journey of this uh, research that we did started from 2018, it ended by 2021, where it could isolate the strains from healthy chicken gut, and we could screen based on certain parameters, and I'll just show you in the forthcoming slides. And Finally, we could standardize the scale-up condition. We did in vivo trials to validate our in vitro data and started using one of the strain in our product, uh, probiotic product. So briefly, the entire workflow was like this. It started with isolation of bacilli strain and because bacilli is a spore former, it is pellet stable. Did with general microbiology and biochemical characterization, we did safety states like uh, hemolysis and cytotoxicity. In Sactoxity, we employed MTTT assay in HT229 cell line. Stability tests, thermostability in bile acid tolerance, performance assays on NSPs and amylase uh, expression profile of these strains. 
the number of strain or isolates kept on reducing as we filtered it down through all these tests. Then antimicrobial assays, um, uh, which involved most of the gram positive and gram negative pathogens. We did surfactin assay as well because identified as a bacilli. We did the strain identification with cystinase ribosomal RNA and then we did whole genome sequencing of all the isolates, which was finally thought to be novel and could add value to the uh, uh, as a product, uh, probiotic product. Then we analyzed the regulatory and functional genes. As I told, uh, the putative virulence factor might not express always, there might not be phenotypic expression of these putative virulence factors. So we analyzed it, in silico analysis was done, and uh, we have mapped one of the strain completely. Other works are going on for other strains in the pipeline. And finally, we validated through a control field trial, which was essentially a challenge trial. I won't go through much deep into it, but just touch upon some of the performance or the results. Oh, this is 16 uh, ribosomal RNA sequencing data of one of the strain, Bacillus siamensis is RMT02. We could isolate, uh, I, mean, open, I, I mean, prune the number of strains that we could isolate into four, two species of Bacillus valagensis and two species of Bacillus siamensis. So the summary of the performance was like this, and uh, safety parameters, performance, the uh, efficacy parameters. And the surfactin assay essentially is a part of anti-infective parameter as because it's a protein family released by the bacilli family, uh, bacilli uh, uh, genus bacteria, which could uh, kill the gram-positive bacteria. See, this is the whole genome sequencing. We uh, use the NGS method, as Dr. Shantani was uh, talking about it, and we did in silico analysis. I'm showing of the one strain, two strains are already being completed, but this is what we are using now in our product formulation. Bacillus siamens is JMT02. We have got a separate phylogenetic tree uh, uh, of Bacillus siamensis. So uh, 4 million base pairs of uh, uh, nucleotides and uh, encoding for 4,000 genes. And uh, it has, uh, uh, I'm not going deep into it, but I'm touch upon two, three things like cellular component, molecular function, biological process. We could identify and characterize these uh, genes which are involved in these processes. We could see the hydrolase activity or carburetic utilizing activity. Um, the genes uh, involved was much, much uh, higher in this particular strain, and it could translate into the performance that uh, we sh saw in the uh, screening studies. We did uh, one more study across all these strains. I'd like to highlight one. This is called inflammatory bile disease model uh, for humans, but essentially it studies how good the anti-inflammatory effect is uh, of the strain. So uh, mesalamine is a drug of choice that is used for the uh, controlling inflammatory bile disease in human. Uh, we saw that when are using in dose-dependent manner, Bacillus siamensis JMT02 can reduce disease activity index in mice. It is induced using distrose saline solution at particular percentage, where the colon length shrink and there are blood in stools. So negative control would show that. Mesalamine is the drug of choice, slow-releasing mesalamine. It's marketed by Zydus Pharmaceuticals and many other company. And uh, we use that and also compared with uh, the uh, increasing dosing of Bacillus siamensis JMT02. And it showed a, it showed a promising uh, anti-inflammatory effect in reducing the gut inflammation based on the parameters we set. So uh, in conclusion, we could find a strain which was stable, anti-infective, it was having anti-inflammatory property. We could uh, uh, analyze the, uh, the structural and regulatory proteins. We could uh, confirm that there are no antimicrobial resistant genes. And uh, we took it further to, uh, to the next level, that is the field-based performance. And I am indebted to my colleagues at JRC um, from Dr. Kashi Vishwanathan and his team who did this work. Um, I quickly go through the in vivo trial that we did. This is our internal trial just to understand which strain we should go for. As, we, as you saw that we pruned down to four strains, that is uh, four strains, two species of Bacillus siamensis and two species of Bacillus valagensis. 
we did a challenge model uh, without uh, AGP in the diet. And uh, essentially, it contained Bacillus siamens to 2 in two of the formulation, F1, F2. And F3, F4, F5 essentially was a combination of different strains that we could isolate. And we introduced a reference strain, PB6 here, and also our old formulation, just to understand how good that the combination of the strains perform than our old product. So we could see that uh, the, yeah, so I'll summarize very quickly. We could see that the formulation uh, F1, uh, uh, that is com com composed of uh, the Bacillus yamensi JMT02, had a better performance efficacy parameters it could have uh, it did have a better uh, uh, you know protection of the histomorphological architecture of the intestinal intestinal uh, the jejunum duodenum and the ileum essentially i'm showing you the data here of the jejunum only we did study the serum alpha 1 acid glycoprotein level which is essentially an a marker for inflammation damage liver secretes it and F1, F2 comprising of JMT02 showed much better result compared to the other you know, uh, treatments. And uh, overall, we could find that it's, it could be a good probiotic candidate that can be used. And we also studying for, you know, studying with the other strains that we have isolated. In future, we might uh, come up uh, with uh, these strains in our product and pipelines. So uh, to conclude, so this was a model. I was not very much interested to show you all the data, but just to give you this, ignite this idea that characterization of probiotic strains is extremely essential. It is mandate in regulated countries in the for human uh, pharmaceutical sector, even for uh, animal healthcare sector in regulated countries, but country like us should start practicing uh, characterization of probiotics. It is very much, very much necessary to understand whether it is able to uh, you know, produce the intended benefit that we are uh, targeting for. And uh, in I've shown one model where we could identify Bacillus CMNC JMT02 as a noble probiotic strain isolated from chicken GIT. Thank you. I'm sorry if, if I've extended the time. Yeah, a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, it was interesting to listen to you. It was just, you know, explaining the process of product development in short. Uh, with the pros and cons, what to precautions are to be taken, what should be taken care of. So it was quite informative. Uh, if there are any specific questions, please, uh, you are welcome. Otherwise, uh, we can, yeah, yeah, just a moment. Ma'am, thank you. Sir, sir, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice presentation, Dr. Mukul. Uh, I have uh, two points to ask you. Uh, you said there are various steps for characterization of uh, probiotics for the screening process. Uh, do you consider even the thermostability and storage stability as one of the main criteria to screen the probiotic species? 100%. Even it was the part of the assessment given by FA and WHO. They were given the assessment for the entire probiotic across different sector being used. So storage and processing stability is extremely important. In our case, it is also so. We have done the uh, stability tests. Essentially, we identified the bacilli, so spore-forming bacteria, and then we... Uh, you know, uh, subjected it to the pelleting conditions and studied the recovery. Also, the bile acid and uh, also the self life. Uh, and essentially, spore forming probiotic have very high self life, not less than 24 months uh, in an inert carrier. So, we have done that, madam. So, and the it's second very, thing, very critical. Yeah, the second thing is uh, because of the problem with the AMR genes and uh, all these stability issues, people are moving ahead towards the postbiotics. So, what do you feel whether? Probiotic yeah, so yeah. postbiotic is essentially a bioactive molecule, uh, you know, metabolite, secreted so. by bioactive metabolite secreted by the uh, uh, the probiotic. So uh, yeah, it's definitely that if you are not able to characterize the probiotic and you are not sure that it is having a putative virulence factor or ant harboring antimicrobial uh, genes, then of course it's a no brainer that uh, the postbiotic would be a much uh, safer option. But again. It is not going to respond to the challenge the way it should be. For example, if you apply a postbiotic, for example, lipopeptides are there, several lipopeptides are there being used. You are mixing at particular inclusion level in the diet. Now the challenge in one feed, now you are supplying the feed to different, I'm talking from a poultry point of view, supplying the feed to different geographical region. And one some place the challenge is more, in some place challenge is less. 
that particular inclusion level is only there to protect. And also, one point, this uh, uh, postbiotic, we need to clarify whether it is effective against gram-negative bacteria or gram-positive bacteria. If it is effective against gram-positive bacteria as well, then your flora is destroyed. Microflora is destroyed. You should have to ensure that the postbiotic that you are talking about should be effective only against gram-negative bacteria. And also, it is the const that dose is constant. You can't increase the dose in midway. Whatever is given in the feed is given. But in case of probiotic, it is a live organism. It will behave based on the challenges it faces in the gut. So that's the advantage of probiotic. Thank you. Thank you, Mughal. Very exciting, very encouraging. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Call upon the last uh, speaker of this session, Dr. K. B. Bharati. He's a master postgraduate in pharm veterinary pharmacology and toxicology and board uh, certified toxicologist from American Board of Toxicology. Currently, she's working with R&D Center and Natural Remedies, Private Limited, India. And uh, she's have more than 2020 research publication in national and international interest. Thank you. Please. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is a little different topic. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, WEPA for giving this opportunity to us. Uh, so phytogenics are the botanicals. So this we have been hearing a lot. Phytogenics or botanicals are uh, definitely becoming uh, vital solutions for the future. Because uh, right now, globally, we are talking about no antibiotic ever, NAE. We are talking about antimicrobial resistance. We are talking about organic. So in all these places, globally, this phytogenic feed additives definitely will add a value. And uh, not just phytogenic feeds, but yes, a lot of research is being done in this area. Uh, and that's the topic of uh, my presentation today. Uh, what kind of advances have been done in the research on phytogenic feed additives? Uh, uh, so I've just put it here. And uh, as we go uh, forward, we will look into what kind of advances we are talking about. So earlier, it was more focused on, the, uh, especially in the phytogenic feed additives, it was more focused on body weight, FCR, uh, uh, mortality, egg production, and biochemical uh, uh, parameters, more of phenotypic responses. Then uh, there is a move towards suitable challenge models. Uh, we will get into the details of it in the subsequent slides. Then, yes, as uh, uh, the speakers of earlier speakers have pointed out, there is a lot of molecular biology peeping in, not only for molecular diagnostics, but also for the pharmacological research or the efficacy research. And then, of course, not the least metagenomics, how uh, the phytogenic feed additives can uh, influence the metagenomics and bring an overall improvement in the uh, uh, production parameters. Of course, having said this, the phenotypic responses always remain critical. However, how these advances have added value, we will look into the subsequent slides. Uh, so from just phenotypic response in normal birds to challenged birds, so these challenges have been created uh, by inducing it, it with LPS, or infection challenges, vaccine challenges, or simple nutrition challenges have been created. But why are these created? Uh, for example, if we check this phytogenic additives in the normal birds, we may get a response. But are we affirmative about the response? We are not very sure about those response and the reproducibility of the results. Hence, we have moved towards this challenged models. So I have taken some examples from our own research to cite here. So uh, this is a product which was meant for uh, uh, synthetic choline replacer as a natural choline. So uh, when this challenge model was created, uh, that whether the choline deficiency in birds, we all know that choline is very important for birds and it creates a lot of fat-induced uh, changes in the birds, fat uh, metabolism and fat uh, uh, 
mobilization pathways. So a challenge model was created wherein choline deficiency was induced in the diet itself by modulating the soya bean uh, meal uh, isolate and the soya bean meal. Uh, so, and then the product was tested and compared it against the synthetic choline chloride. So the results were very interesting. I am not presenting the results per se, uh, because all these uh, results we can see in the published literature as well. But just to take you through the kind of models that are getting created, as we can see here, there's a choline deficient model which has been created. The group one is not uh, uh, is having optimal recommended choline content. Group two is having a little bit of deficit and group three, four, five, six are having much deficits. And at what deficit the product will act is what uh, tried to be understood. Of course, the research does not stop here. It is again uh, for the reproducibility of the results. It is again tried in normal birds and definitely compared with the synthetic choline chloride. So such kind of challenged models will help in understanding the reproducibility and translatability of the claims that we are trying to make that it is a greener alternative to synthetic choline chloride. So this is one step. Then uh, it's not just performance, but uh, the research has moved from performance to performance and genomics as well. Of course, the speakers earlier to me have briefed about the uh, molecular biology techniques they have used. And uh, Dr. Sayanthini has briefed about the uh, uh, tools which have been used for diagnosis purpose. But here, it has been used in a clinical trial to understand how the product works. And of course, genomics always give uh, um, a very good uh, uh, conviction that the product is working for so and so benefits. So here, we can clearly see what does my, we used a microarray technique uh, in one of our study. Here, what we have done, we have looked at the cluster of genes that are relevant to particular function and, uh, uh, and looked at how these cluster of genes are behaving in the treated group versus not treated group. So this was the study model wherein group one was treated with normal diet, group two was treated with choline deficient diet, Group 3 was treated with natural choline uh, uh, added to the choline deficient diet and group 4 was treated with uh, synthetic choline chloride. And how this, sorry, how these genes got expressed in each of these groups have been looked at. And of course, these studies uh, are always done in collaboration with the molecular biologists. Uh, uh, so we take their support in terms of what kind of a uh, tissue has to be selected, what kind of a cluster genes has to be selected, again, based on the end indication that we are trying to claim. So uh, these cluster of genes are very well uh, uh, put in uh, form of heat maps by the molecular biologists, and uh, it gives a very good clear evidence on how the phytogenic additive is working. As we, we can see on the left-hand side, uh, the green color, wherein normal versus choline deficient diet model, what kind, what, what are the genes that got down-regulated? And the heat map very clearly gives that the synthetic choline chloride as well as the uh, greener alternative for the uh, synthetic choline chloride, that is the phytogenic additive, how it is reversing the effects, how it is reversing the down-regulated genes, how these choline chloride as well as the choline uh, as well as the greener alternative or the phytogenic additive is upregulating those genes so how it is reversing the issues caused by choline deficiency that's very clearly understood from this heat map and we can see the genes uh, that got modulated by the phytogenic feed additive that are listed on the right hand side now similarly so this is Again, these genes, this cluster of genes are more relevant to fat metabolism pathways or fat mobilization pathways. Now again, similarly, in the normal control and uh, um, how there are some genes in the choline chloride deficient diet which got upregulated and how these changes were reversed by uh, the phytogenic additive as well as the synthetic choline chloride, we can see a clear heat map which depicts that the product, how it is performing. So what does this indicate? Why are we looking at these genes and all those things? So here again, the functional annotation is kept here, that how the phytogenic 
uh, additive is bringing in beta oxidation, mitochondrial biogenesis, fat mobilization, and how it is inhibiting uh, the cholesterol synthesis in the liver and how it is helping the liver function and how it is replacing all the choline chloride functions. So uh, this brings a conviction how a phytogenic product can work. Uh, in case of synthetic products, it is very clear that uh, anti-inflammatory mechanism is by COX, LOX, or by PGE2. But how a phytogenic works is something which is always, a, uh, I would say, it is always a, um, it's always something which, as you keep exploring, so much things come out. This is one technique which answers this question, how a phytogenic addresses it. It hits multiple genes and brings in that mechanism that it is intended to show in the bird. So this is one level wherein genomics have been used. Then, of course, uh, metabolomics are also have been used in the uh, phytogenic feed additive research. So uh, as we all know, genomics says what can happen and metabolomics says what actually happened in the bird. So um, uh, again, here again, it is again dependent on the uh, uh, on what we want to assess, whether we want to assess performance, whether we want to assess fat metabolism. Here, the uh, thought was to assess the um, uh, if the metabolites in the serum are uh, are uh, providing a growth benefits and the immune enhancing benef benefits to the uh, uh, to the bird. And again, uh, the cluster of metabolites that are relevant to these two functions, that is um, to the growth as well as to the immune function have been selected. And how these cluster of metabolites behaved in the treated group versus untreated group have been analyzed. So this is a study design and it is also looked at various stages in the broil, uh, uh, in the starter, finisher and the grower phases. So these are the bo box plots. And these are the metabolites which are looked in, that is beta alanine formate and uh, hydroxyproline. These are the metabolites which got modulated by the phytogenic additive. So what does that mean? Uh, how does it functionally annotate to? So beta alanine can increase the carnosin and it can cause pH buffering, antioxidant effects and synthesis of muscle carnosin and helps, in, uh, helps to have a quality uh, muscle in the fast growing broiler chicken. So that's what it annotates to. And there was also an increase in the treated group format levels, the phytogenic treated group format levels. And what does that indicate? Format is something which is majorly required for immune cell expansion. So this metabolite in the serum clearly indicates that there has been, uh, the phytogenic can help for immune enhancement. So this is about the metabolomics. The metabolites clearly indicated that how the phytogenic is uh, giving, an, uh, giving a hint that it will be helpful in immune enhancement as well as in the muscle quality. So that was about the uh, moving from the uh, challenged models using genomics, using metabolomics, and of course, this is a hot topic which everybody knows and it is very contemporary also. Uh, the metagenomics, uh, which is nothing but the genome of the entire community that is present in the intestine or the cica or the, uh, or the parts of the intestine. Now, why is metagenomics so important? Because metagenomics is connected with everything now. It is connected to the performance, it is connected to the gut integrity, it is connected to the gut immunity, it is connected overall to the performance of the bird. Uh, that's where there is a lot of research happening on probiotics, postbiotics, and many other things because these are the influencers of metagenomics. So, so this we all know that it is the microbiota or the gut microbiome balance that brings in a lot of uh, effects on the whole body itself. So uh, there's a lot in metagenomics again. Of course, uh, as I was telling that whenever we start looking at, uh, uh, whenever we start looking at the uh, impact of the phytogenics, and whenever we start using the molecular biology techniques, we start involving scientists, molecular biology scientists, right from the study initiation. Uh, wherein we take a lot of inputs from them, what to collect, how to collect, and they help us throughout the study. 
So they get involved right from even before the study inception uh, with a lot of input so that uh, they and they guide us throughout the study and finally even in the interpretation of the data as well. Uh, and of course, Bangalore is having a lot of genomic labs, so they always help us. Uh, and uh, even the short chain fatty acids, these are the energy providers for the microbiome or the genome that is present in the intestine. So this is also one good parameter which can be looked at, how the short chain, uh, short chain fatty acids are being modulated by the phytogenics. And interestingly, phytogenics have a very good uh, role in these things by multiple modes of action again. Uh, they could be directly providing uh, some kind of fiber. They could be directly providing, uh, they could be a mild anti-inflammatory agent so that they modulate this microbiota. So that there are multiple mechanisms where phytogenics could be useful in managing the metagenomics. So it's not just set, but it is also found. There are multiple uh, uh, research articles published on metagenomics. So uh, people know that there is a wealth of evidence in top research journals to support improvement in performance of poultry when the firmicute percentage changes in the CICA. If it goes up, then it is known to have a very good uh, uh, impact on the uh, performance of the bird. So this was the design wherein the herbal growth promoter was looked at and how it is impacting the firmicutes to bacteroids ratio. So uh, it's not just one genus increases, it is good. One genus decreases, it is good. But it is the biosis, it's the entire diversity, how it is protecting and it is how this modulate, how the uh, phyto, uh, phytogenic is modulating, that is what is important. It is not just one phyla uh, or one genus, but it is overall the diversity and the entire community, how it is getting modulated is what is the key. And uh, uh, from the research, it is very clearly evidence the phytogenics does a very good role in that. So if these are some of the evidences where uh, multiple places the trial has been done, the samples were taken, and when it is looked at, there was a pretty good consistency in some of the, uh, as we have seen that Firmicutes phyla itself, there is an increase, uh, and there is a decrease in bacteroids uh, uh, um, uh, um, counts. So there's a good, pretty good consistency is what this slide uh, shows. So, uh, so phytogenics does influence, first of all, uh, microbiota, and there's a pretty good consistency. So overall, uh, what the research is advancing towards, of course, the research is advancing from just phenotypic to phenotypic and at the organ level. So we all know we have been doing histo uh, histology, we have been doing um, a lot of uh, studies at the tissue level with the biomarkers. Now we are moving towards cellular level in, the, in phytogenic research, uh, metagenomics and uh, metabolomics and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, there's a lot to go forward uh, in terms of understanding how these things are impacting um, uh, at the gene level, at the molecular level. Uh, so we are on the path of finding more and more uh, and getting advanced in the phytogenic research. So thank you all for your uh, attention and thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, I, I believe, because many times these questions are asked. The results are seen. Performance to dikta hai, like in how it works. The herbal products or the organic products, so to say. So you have tried to answer some of those questions. It's very nice. And this is the future, actually. That's yes. what I was trying to tell you. Uh, all the chemical molecules and other things are going to fade away. And this is the future. We are going back, back to the basics of 1,000 years ago. In our country, we had all these uh, herbals, phytogenetics, phytobiotics in place. Uh, earlier, Mukul also explained about the curds. Now, curds have been in, in use for so many uh, generations, so many decades, so many centuries. But now we know more about that, and that is going to be very useful for future information. Thank you very much. If there are any specific questions, pertinent questions, please welcome. Not a question, it's just an appreciation. Um, you rightly say that it's very difficult to prove the efficacy of phytogenics because for other synthetic 
products, it's very easy. And challenge method is actually one from where you can prove that the product really works. Actually, inducing choline deficiency is difficult because Colin is naturally present in the feedstuffs, but I could see that you could actually produce a feed with 500 and 600 of Colin, which is really appreciative. And uh, I really appreciate the work. And talking about metagenomics in such a wider and a simplified manner, I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you for that appreciation, but this appreciation goes to my team members who are sitting in the lab. So, uh, the, I mean, one of my team members is here uh, who has created that model also. So, it, as you said, it was not easy. Uh, yeah, it, because I want, wanted to ask that, but because of the paucity of time, because the liver is keeping synthesizing the choline every now and then. Yeah. So, how could you create that and how could you control the quantity of choline being synthesized intrinsically in the body? We can chat about, about that later on also. Yeah, sure. So if there are no more questions, I think uh, I will ask uh, to conclude this session, Dr. Please. Thank you so much. So thank you all the speakers. And before to facilitating our present session, the previous session, Dr. Quentin Wang presented through online for uh, to facilitate the person, I will request to the company representative, Mr. Praveen, and Dr. Sanjati, and Dr. Mr. Madhu to come and receive the mementos, please. I will request our uh, Ranadesar Provost Chair to deliver the mementos. Please. They will take photo, huh? They will do it. Yeah. They just scan it. Now I will call upon the present session speakers, Dr. Sayantani. Dr. Prithirisraj Kumar, and Dr. Mughal, and Dr. Paradi. One by one, please. Just do it in that one, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Dr. Prithirisraj, sir. Please go and check. Okay. Sir, one group photo they want to take all the press speakers. <coughs> So now it is the time to honor our uh, chairs, coaches, and repetitors. I will request our beloved uh, Dr. Rahman sir to come and sit here to honor our chairs and coaches and repetitors, please. Oh. 
torture malindi madam dr lena डॉक्टर वेणु सर डॉक्टर अनिल कुमार thank you ragman sir yeah they can have a group photo please <coughs> Thank you very much for all the speakers, chairs, and court circuit and reporters. Now I'll request Dr. Kobe for some announcement, please. Sir, one two minutes. Court sir, thank you. Two minutes. Court sir, one minute. Thank you, sir. We have come to the end of the technical sessions. Now it's time to felicitate the evaluators of the post session three. So I request Raghman sir to felicitate the evaluators. First, Dr. Ankur Rastogi Jammu acted as chairman. Sir, please. Sir, please. <laughs> Chairman, next, Dr. Rima Sakya, Assam panelist. Next panelist is Dr. A. Ilamurgan, panelist. I also request Dr. Amita Rina Gomes, ma'am, who worked as panelist in the poster session one. Dr. Rina Gomes. Okay, she's not there. Okay, please. You can take a group photo. We can have a group photograph of Thank you, sir. So with that, we have come to the conclusion of all the technical and poster sessions. Now we will break for the lunch and we will assemble 2 o'clock for validatory function. Thank you. I request all the delegates to assemble in the auditorium for the valedictory session.
Every beginning has an end and every end is a new beginning. Honorable dignitaries, chief guest, guest of honor and learned delegates, a very good afternoon to one and all, one and all and a warm welcome to this valedictory session. May I now take the privilege of inviting all the dignitaries to the dais. I invest chief guest Dr. O.P. Chaudhary sir, guest of honor Dr. H. Rehman sir, director NINP Dr. N. K. S. Gauda sir, MD EW Nutrition Dr. Shirish Nigam sir, and president WVPA Dr. Jitendra Varma sir to the dais. I request organizing secretary Dr. P.K. Malik sir to the dais. Thank you sir. Myself, Dr. Amita Gomes feel privileged to congratulate World Veterinary Poultry Association India and National Institute of Animal Nutrition and Physiology for making a significant milestone of these two beautiful days in our lives today. Over the last two days, we have had a deep insights into several issues of avian health and focused mainly on challenges and opportunities. Now, without taking much of your time, I would like to invite organizing secretary of this conference, Dr. P.K. Malik, sir, to welcome and felicitate our chief guest, Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, sir, with flowers and bouquet. A round of applause. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. P.K. Malik to welcome and felicitate our guest of honor, Dr. H. Rahman, sir, with flowers and a shawl. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. P.K. Malik, sir, to welcome Director ICR NINP NKS Gowda, sir, with flower and shawl. I request audience for a round of applause. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. P.K. Malik, sir, to welcome Dr. Sirish Nigam, sir, MD EW Nutrition with flowers and shawl. Thank you, sir. I request you to welcome President WPA India, Dr. Jitendra Varma, sir, with flowers and shawl. Thank you, sir. I also welcome you to this valedictory session. May I now invite Dr. Jitendra Varma, sir, President, World Veterinary, World Veterinary Poultry Association India to present the welcome address. Honorable Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, Joint Secretary, NLM, 
Krishi Bhavan, New Delhi, Honorable Dr. Rahman sir, Director NINP Dr. Gowda, General Secretary WBPA India Dr. Shirish Nigam, Organizing Secretary of this WBPA India Conference 2024 Dr. Pradeep Malik, Honorable President of World Veterinary Poultry Global, Dr. Shaq, President of WVPA, Bangladesh, Dr. Rafikul Islam, uh, High Dignitaries, Senior Professors, Scientists, Distinguished Guests, Director of uh, Nishad, Dr. Aniket Sanyal, and invited speakers, distinguished guests, and my friends. It was, we started yesterday with the Honorable Venkaya Nadu sir coming here and inaugurating the event. From that time, Till now, how it has gone, I do not know. It was very smooth. Everything went on very well. The meticulous planning of uh, Dr. Pradeep and the team, uh, Dr. Kolte, the entire team, the director of uh, his tube, they took a lot of pains to do that. All the speakers, those who have uh, delivered their lectures, it, they were fantastic. They were on, on job. They have done wonderfully well to showcase what exactly the advancement we need to take the poultry science uh, forward as a subject, as a industry. The main thing is that, that we need to collaborate together and see what exactly is required, which is, which is very, very important for the industry. I thank everyone that those who have contributed especially the chairs, co-chairs. So all the faculty, those who have conducted those different uh, events, otherwise it would, have, it would have not been possible for to do that. So the message which I want to give from here that this is an international event which we do every year and hopefully we try to do it in the month of February. I request all of you to please register for WVPA India membership. The membership is uh, for uh, lifetime. So once you become the member, so it's a lifetime member because uh, we do not have the machinery to do it on a uh, annual basis. So I request all of you, especially the students and the staff of this institute and the colleagues, those who are from industry, please register for World Veterinary Poultry uh, India registration so that uh, we have good number to participate in future coming events. I do not want to say thanks. Thanks will be given many times. But I will say that uh, best of luck for your all future endeavors. Whatever you are doing, please do with full ethics and honesty. And God is there to help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Managing Director, EW Nutrition, Dr. Sirish Nigam, sir, to address the gathering. Good afternoon to dignitaries on the dais, of the dais, and it's a great pleasure for me to give a brief report on behalf of the executive committee of WVPA. I myself, Shirish, currently holding position of general secretary of your association, WVPA India chapter. And I would like to thank the executive council, Dr. Ajit Ranade, sir, Dr. PK Shukla, sir, Dr. Nag Lakshmi, ma'am, Dr. Das, our beloved president, dynamic leader, Dr. Jitend Verma, and Dr. Bichitra Barman, who could not make it this time due to some family reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, 
as you know from the president that the WBPA is a professional organization and we have blessed with the presence of WBPA president right away from Netherlands. I will request the audience to give a big warm round of applause for our global president. Thank you, sir. And as they say that you have to have a good relationship with your neighbors because it brings prosperity. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Rafikul Islam, sir, from Bangladesh, Dhaka. Welcome, sir, to India. Welcome to the Indian chapter of WVPA. Uh, first of all, uh, sometimes you have to remember that the people, those who are pillar of inspiration. So the students, the professors, Dr. Raghavendra Bhatta, sir, Dr. Gaura, sir, on the dais, Dr. Rehman, sir, Dr. Jitain Verma, and my fellow brother, Dr. Malik, who maintained and organized this event flawlessly. They need to be thanked on behalf of the Executive Council of WVPA India. And I would like to sincerely extend, you know, from heartfelt thanks to our beloved and the open to industry, the bureaucrat, Joint Secretary, Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You have, you have always given us, you know, kind of a motivation, whether we are in crisis or whenever we look forward for a guidance, you have always given us the right advice. We value your association, sir, and we look forward to continue it in the future. You were the chief guest or I think the president uh, for the event last year, which was organized in Jabalpur our own alma mater. I am passed out of JNKVV Jabalpur. So we were very happy that we did in JNKVV Jabalpur. And this event was titled as Recent Advances in Avian Diseases and Management, a Global Perspective. This event showcased 14 international speakers. They have come from USA, South Korea, China, Sri Lanka, and Czech Republic. And very exciting exchange of thoughts, cross-pollination happened, and those recommendations were submitted to the Department of Animal Husbandry. And I'm sure a couple of these things policy makers have imbibed in their policy paper. And you see the shape of the Animal Husbandry Infrastructure Development Fund originating with that inspiration. And the couple of other, uh, like animal quarantine services, the registration of the products at the AHD, and the various other uh, interventions done by the government for the benefit of the industry and the farmers. So I would like to again thank, as Dr. O.P. Chaudhary is only Mukhiya of the government who is here on the dais, so would like to thank the entire staff and your team, sir, for their support to us. So I think ek tali to jordar banti hai. The most important thing is research and innovation for, you know, creating the wealth in the country. And as our beloved ex-Vice President Vankayaji said yesterday, a nation can be healthy and wealthy when it focuses on research and development. And we are in the university of uh, leader Dr. Gaurasar is taking the new charge of this Institute of Repute. We look forward that more research and innovation in future will be driving the competence of our country and will develop certain technologies which reduces the cost of farmers and improves the quality of the product for our consumers. And we as a part of industry are committed to do the kind of the support which we, have, we can do. And here I have a ex clefma president, Mr. Neeraj Srivasto, our Mr. Mahesh from CPDO, Mr. Selvam Kannan representing industry, Dr. Gopal Reddy, and uh, Giridhar, my own friend. So I look forward for all of you leaders to give direction, my junior Dr. Sandeep Gupta. So you all are having innovation and a strength to co collaborate and cooperate. And please come along with WPPA, we can do a lot of change and we can act as a change agent and a catalyst. And Dr. Venu, you are also having a lot of information about the management things. We can cross-pollinate with the industry, should cross-pollinate with the institute, so that the students which are passing, they are well aware 
and today the one such event done by our president wvpa about the allocation competition of the students so that they should not have fear and they can express their thoughts flawlessly having said that the last but not the least most important factor is how we collaborate and connect and to this we require constant communication wvpa is doing this a small bit because we are writing a newsletter aerosol which is getting circulated and we are also having the most reputed avian pathology journal which is considered as one of the book of reference or the journal of reference and this way we are spreading the knowledge throughout the world these efforts will be ongoing and at the level of wvp india we would like to amplify this and this cannot happen without the constant support of our current members and we urge that the here the students the professors the academic community those who are not the member of the wvpa they please visit our website www.wvpa.in and take the membership of wvpa as our president dr jitendra verma outlined that the good luck is there for all of you but how we convert the good luck you know when the opportunity meets preparation then you become lucky so let's prepare ourselves by sharing the knowledge and doing research and development with these kind words i would like to thank each one of you for your valuable time our sponsors i think it's a long list but i would like to thank i'm also one of them but i would like to thank all sponsors that without your contribution this event could not have been organized successfully and we look forward for the next session of the wvpa as our president said in 2025 the venue will be decided there is a competition among the various venues we have to see the logistics cost and the voting between the mc and then we will decide but we look forward for an exciting session and you all will be knowing that why i am putting this hat because for me it's an advantage i will become more photogenic because i have no hairs you know so thank you very much for listening me patiently i wish each one of you safe journey back home thank you from all of us thank you thank you sir for enlightening us with your words may i now request acting director icr national institute of animal nutrition and physiology dr nks gowda sir to address the gathering sir please ellarigu namaskara good afternoon uh, each one of you respected uh, dignitaries and the dais our uh, chief guest uh, Uh, dr op choudhary sir and uh, all our uh, dignitaries uh, dr jitendra verma ji and the dais dr shirish nigam ji and uh, our former uh, ddg and uh, also the senior officer from milri dr habibur rahman sir and uh, my colleague and organizing secretary dr pk malik and all the distinguished uh, delegates is difficult to name uh, uh, each one of you so i welcome uh, once again for this valedictory function and uh, at the outset i thank world veterinary poultry association for choosing an np in the year uh, 2020 february same month four years back uh, the same auditorium witnessed this uh, conference i think it was for a one day i remember so i think uh, it indicates two days means there is uh, growing in strength so last four years back the conference was for one day and now it is for two days that means uh, it is the uh, association is much strengthened maybe next after uh, they do their conference maybe it's for three days most of the associations like our nsi or ida the conference is for three days so maybe uh, it will be strengthened so much that it will be for three days so that's what i wish and uh, i thank uh, our verma ji for uh, giving me giving me this uh, giving this opportunity to nnp so that uh, we are mutually benefited so not only we are associated in uh, functioning with this uh, association also technically uh, we learn a lot so we have students we have research scholars and we have young scientists ಆಗಿತ್ತು ಚ 
Check for Dr. Hugs. One more uh, important event is uh, the visit of our uh, former Vice President of India and also the Chairman of Rajya Sabha, Sri Venkai Naiduji. So what happens, uh, uh, any former politician or any uh, important minister visits, so he knows the strength of the institute. So it will become that more easy when you contact them for any work, for any project or any important uh, policy matters. So that becomes easy. So he knows our institute now. And he knows the, what the strength of and the facilities of this institute. So that way, yesterday we saw him eloquently speaking about the science, the importance of poultry, importance of egg, importance of meat in food security. So that way, we were lucky to uh, have him here. So witnessing our, uh, uh, seeing this institute and witnessing the facilities here. And uh, as usual, technical sessions were uh, very well conducted yesterday. Unfortunately, today due to another uh, online meeting with our director general and also our uh, director general, uh, DDG, and uh, we could not be there, myself and Dr. Sanyal, since morning 9 to till now, we were there in that online meeting. So about this uh, Zone 8, uh, Krishi Vijjana Kendra and ICR meeting. So I could not attend uh, today's uh, morning sessions. Hopefully, I think they were uh, well conducted. And uh, many sessions were uh, dealt, like antimicrobials, feed safety, and uh, many uh, innovations were uh, dealt. So that were uh, very useful to all of us, including the NNP staff and uh, all our uh, delegates. It was very, very uh, helpful. And uh, another important thing I noticed and heard was the visit of uh, Mysore by our uh, dignitaries and our particularly foreign dignitaries. I can see the photos and I thank our Dr. Girdar and Dr. Arang Swami. In fact, uh, earlier I was the chairman of that committee because uh, I assumed the charges acting director here. I could not go. I requested our Dr. Girdar and Dr. Arang Swami to co uh, that, uh, conduct that uh, Mysore visit. I heard it was very wonderful. And also one more uh, uh, now also we are getting appreciation for the cultural program. So for that also I was the uh, committee chairman. In fact, this troop uh, we could uh, get them for the G20. So very well appreciated in the same uh, dais, except for the screen. So they had less space to perform. Otherwise, they did a wonderful job. So now also I see a lot of messages uh, pouring in, in uh, appreciations of their excellent performance. And uh, without taking much time, once again, I uh, compliment uh, all of you for uh, participating and learning more uh, for the cause of science and poultry. And uh, particularly, I compliment and congratulate Dr. Varmaji. So almost one week he is here only. So I think uh, maybe two, three hours only must have slept. Rather, NNP has become his home now. So I think he has forgotten his uh, actual home. So he was here only. And also our uh, Dr. Malik and Dr. Kolte. So these are the three people uh, took major uh, burden of this conference. Also, our uh, most of the committees, I don't want to name them now. Uh, maybe when uh, Dr. Malik and Dr. Varmaji, their stress level come down. So maybe next week uh, we'll meet here. Uh, thank individually all our staff, not only our regular staff, our students, our contact staff, all were there for uh, any moment of help they were there. So I thank in general, but uh, specifically we'll be uh, thanking next week in a separate uh, occasion here. So with these uh, few words, uh, I conclude my uh, remarks and uh, thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your words of wisdom. May I now request guest of honor, Dr. Rehman, sir, to felicitate organizing secretary of previous WVPA conference, Dr. Giriraj Goyalji. I call upon Dr. Giriraj Goyalji to receive the felicitation. Thank you, sir. Sir, I also request you to felicitate office bearers of WVPA. I call upon Dr. Shak David, President, World Veterinary Poultry Association Global. Oh, sorry, he is... Okay, okay, sorry. I, I call upon Dr. Jitendra Varmaji, Dr. A.S. Ranadiji, Dr. Pankaj Shuklaji, and Dr. Shirish Nigamji to receive the felicitation.
I call upon Dr. A. S. Ranadiji. I call upon Dr. Shirish Nigamji to receive the felicitation. Thank you, sir, for felicitating office bearers of uh, World Veterinary Poultry Association. So I request all for the group photo. I take the honor uh, of uh, felicitating a few of our uh, dignitaries, those who were not yesterday. So I will like to call upon Chaudhary sir, just thoda sa help kadi dignin ko. So I request Neera Shrivastav, please. Neera Shrivastav. Next is Dr. Nagbushan. Nagbushan is here. Uh, uh, I, I request uh, you to come. Come. You take on his behalf. Yeah. Uh, we have Lokesh uh, from Venkis. Uh, he will take on behalf of Nagbushan. Then uh, Manjesh. Manjesh, uh, you come. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Nag Dr. Nagbushan and on behalf of uh, Manjesh, uh, uh, Babu, you come. Then uh, I request uh, Mr. Girdhar. Mm. Mm. Dr. Patta Damodar, Dr. Patta Damodar. Dr. Patta Damodar. And the last, Dr. Sanjay Gaukare. Dr. Sanjay Gaukare, please.
So thank you very much for accepting our uh, uh, token of love. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now request Rayman, sir, to address the gathering. What's your name? Ramita. Hmm? Dr. Ramita. Ramita. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramita. Honorable chief guest to this function, my close associate, my friends, Dr. O.P. Chaudhriji, Joint Secretary, DADF, Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairying, Go Government of India, Dr. N.K. Goda, Director of this institute, Dr. Jitendra Varma, all you know, his, uh, I was amazed with his uh, multi-facet activities. Yesterday night, we have seen his singing, his dancing, and uh, that's how we are really <laughs> a lot of energy with him. Dr. Siris Nigam, his managing director, nutrition. The most, uh, my most favorite, Dr. P.K. Malik, the organizing secretary of this institution. And uh, I can also say he is the PI of our ILRI ICR project on methane emission that they are doing here. Very senior colleagues sitting other side of the dais, Dr. Islam from Bangladesh. I used to visit many times Bangladesh, particularly SARC meeting and some other occasions. And particularly, the, I, I think that there are many students, they have also joined here the participants from India and abroad, maybe ICR, many directors from ICR institutions are also here. At the very outset, uh, I thank, I expressed my gratitude to Dr. Malik for inviting, organizing secretary of this conference for inviting me and also to the association for inviting me and uh, giving the chance to speak few words on this occasion. I am really delighted, I am honored that I will not take much time because uh, amongst us, Dr. O.P. Chaudhary Sahab present here, he can speak so much of things and uh, will be really enjoy his uh, way of talking, the he narrated the things in so joyful manner. Just uh, one or two things. What is the importance of poultry sector in India? Just uh, I have gone through because all poultry specialists here. I will, if I am wrong, can you can correct me also. Presently, we are producing about 130 billion eggs per year. The per capita availability is on 0 0.5. That is also very less than the recommended of uh, government of India. It is on 80 eggs per person per year. But that's why there is a challenge also opportunities in this sector how to we can increase the production so that uh, we can meet up the requirement of our population. In the morning, Dr. Mahesh told uh, we have to take two eggs in the morning, two eggs in the evening. Then what will be the production na, in that way? And for your information, ILRI has developed livestock master plan. First, it is on Bihar, then we 
completed for Odisha, and now we're working in Maharashtra. And basic objective of that livestock master plan, what is the present requirement? What will be the requirement for last five years and 10 years, 15 years? We are giving the not only the estimate, what will be the requirement for development of infrastructure, what will be the manpower requirement, all how, the, how many poultry or animal farms should be established, how many vaccine producing centers should be established in that way we are giving. And we are appreciated by the government of India and other states. <clears throat> and recently we, th we, we have started the working on the livestock master plan in Maharashtra. This is supported by World Bank project. Well, uh, many of you already know that what is ILRI. ILRI is one of the 15 CGIR research center. CGIR is the consultative group on an international livestock uh, agriculture researches. It is almost uh, equivalent to FAO in other side. And we have 15 CG centers and only ILRI is working for the livestock sector. We have another center we called World Fisheries that they are working on fisheries and other 13 centers, as you know, that always plant is taking the advantage. It is like that everywhere. ILRI is working in India from 2004. We have office, this the regional office for the South Asia based in Delhi. I am looking after as the regional rep for South Asia. We have a office in Guwahati. We have office at Hyderabad, Patancharu. And uh, that is uh, uh, hosted by ICRISAT. And recently we have closed another office in Bhuvneshwar because the project is over. Among the country, we have started a country center in Nepal. There was a lot of request from Bangladesh also, but we hopefully will also start a center in Bangladesh because Bangladesh has sizable livestock and uh, huge population depends on the livestock sector. In that way, that ILRI is working in different way. And uh, basic idea to reduce the poverty, providing food and nutritional security, and working with the national and international research centers, organizations, ICR institutes, university, to doing upstream research in this sector with the objective to provide better lives through livestock sector. That is the basic idea for the ILRI. As uh, all you know, the, what is the requirement that I have already mentioned, that is the lot of scope for poultry industry because from 105 egg to, if we go want to go to 180 eggs, the how much establishment requirement, how much funding will be requirement, what is the other manpower requirement, and uh, ministry representative, Dr. Choudhury Sahib is already here. The, this is our request so that at least the people can get egg. This is the cheapest source of protein, best quality of protein, and we are getting from that. While visiting in Bangladesh, I was discussing with the DGDLS, and they have shown me the number of egg produced in Bangladesh. It is much higher than the India. Then I contested how it is possible, because it's Bangladesh is, is equivalent to Odisha, only one state of our country. Then after that, he calculated that was some mistake in the calculation. It cannot be because we have so much of poultry, big poultry in that way. 
anyway, that uh, Bangladesh is also producing very good uh, egg production, because particularly backyard poultry. Recently, we have uh, developed the SNP chip for backyard poultry. This was released the last three days back by our Honorable DG ICR and uh, in presence of DG Ilri was also there. If you can use that genom genomic chips, you will get a lot of information, whatever, everything is included, particularly for the backyard genomics in the country. Similarly, Ilri has developed the Livestock Master Plan. A Livestock Master Plan is the roadmap for the livestock sector in that. And we have also developed another technology, that means website that we call the Bakri Mitra. That is in the, if you can go to the App Store, you can get that, what is the number of uh, the caprine, that means goat available in the country, which goat should be suitable from various these. And this was done in association with the goat institution Magdum. So this is some of the activities we are doing in this. And uh, particularly, just I want to mention what we are doing with ICAR. ICAR is giving funding under window three a huge amount, and we presently we have four projects. One project particularly is leading at this institution, Methane Emission and Mitigation. Dr. P.K. Malik is the PI, and under that project, we developed a anti-methanogenic product we call Harit Dhara. Those will not understand Harit Dhara. Harit means green, Dhara means earth. We want to make the world or this country green with that, because that product reduce 20% methane emission when we are adding with their feet. This technology has been given to many organizations, farms, in that way that's becoming very popular. And as I mentioned, it is reducing 20% methane emission by the animals. Another thing that we are presently doing, as you know, India is having porous border. There are many places, many diseases are entering the country. Bird flu came, <laughs> always some one or other diseases are coming. Recently we have African swine fever, then we have the LSD, LSD has already killed more than two lakh animals in the country in that way. That's why we have taken a project, we are developing the life vaccines and diagnostic for some diseases that never been reported in India. One of them is the African swine fever, but swine fever has already entered. The second, we are working on the MARS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, because uh, from Pakistan, it may come any time to the Gujarat and Rajasthan because they, we have a lot of camel population in that. And another is the rift belly fever. That is a very important genotic disease. In that way, we are working with uh, ICR, working with the government of India. We are giving this type of support, technical support, not exactly a technical partner. We are working with this. I once again thank the organizer of this conference for giving us invited or giving the opportunity. And uh, Dr. Varma, I already mentioned, is a multifaceted person. And Dr. Malik is uh, very close. And uh, you have seen the facilities here only. Our Honorable DG ICR, he used to tell that in Bangalore, we have two A1 institutions. One is South, one is North. South, it is the NINP Bangalore. And another institution, we have Nivedi. Nivedi, that institution built by me 
and uh, given the name of that institution. These two institutions, we have 10 ICR institutes in, in Bangalore, but these two he has dedicated, <laughs> told that A1 institution on north and another south. That is the importance of this. I once again congratulate the organizers for conducting the so much of the all people participated. I have seen almost all session I have also attended. Always the presence is very, at least uh, quantum is good that way. So, but uh, sometimes uh, that uh, we say something, no? that uh, a beautiful lady looks more beautiful with a black spot. It's something always will be missing on when we are organizing with a big, this, that type of things always happen, but little spot is always there, but I'm not mentioning what is there or not in that way. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And once again, I congratulate the Participants, those are getting certificates, honor, or uh, prizes in this next a couple of time, a couple of minutes. They will be receiving their recognition in this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your words. May I now request today's chief guest and joint secretary, Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairying, Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairying, Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, sir, to present the awards to the winners. I call upon Dr. Gopi, Joint Organizing Secretary, to present the list of winners. Thank you, ma'am. I request all the delegates in the desk to join the presentation. Can I have to come on, Dr. Gopi? So it's for poster session awards. We have received more than 100 abstracts and we have split them in three sessions. For this session one on emerging health issues, AMR and public health. The third prize goes to Dr. A. Ilamurugan and on the work on conjugated mediated transfer of expanded spectrum of beta lactamase. The second prize goes to Abhinaya Kaliyapan from IVRI. The work on TLR7 and TLR21. Crosstalk. The first prize goes to Dr. S. Bindu, IVRI, for their work on immune gene expression profile. The poster session two on nutrition and gut health. The third prize goes to Yes Pavin Shah from VCRI Namakal. Her work on replacement of solvent extracted soya bean meal. So, solvent extracted soya bean meal with extruded expeller soya bean meal. And the second prize goes to Kanvijal Jit Kaur Jammu. I request and okay, this is there. Okay, her work on the effect of dietary supplementation of prebiotics extracted from rumen liquor. And the first prize goes to M Shoba, ICR NINT Bangalore, for their work on. Green synthesis of nano oxide, nano, zinc oxide nanoparticles using leaf extracts. This is NNPC.
and the third session on innovative approaches in breeding, product quality, processing, and food safety. The third race goes to Naswar Khan P from Tripadi. The title is Prevalence of SPA genes among Staphylococcus aureus isolated of meat samples. And the second prize, Vijay L from IVRI. The work is on effect of time and temperature on sensory parameters of cooked chicken breast curry. And the first prize goes to Anjana P from CRI. The title of her work is Effect of Clutch, Shishan and Time on Lay of Primary Sex Ratio in White Lagoon Birds. Please. So with that poster session so over, for the first time we have introduced to students allocation competitions. So here we have three winners. The third prize goes to Dr. Brinda Gomes from NINP. And the second prize goes to Dr. M. Bhavadharani IVRI. First prize, Dr. P. Anjana, Manuti Veterinary College. Sir, we also want to felicitate our evaluators of students' allocation. So I'd like to welcome our chairman, Dr. Pankaj Kumar Sukla, sir, for our felicitation. Panelists. Dr. K. Pramavalli, panelist Dr. Amita Bhattacharya from Matra. Dr. Gopal Reddy from IVRI, IVPA Bangalore. And the last, Mr. Neeraj Srivastava. Congratulations to all the award winners. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gopi, and I congratulate all the winners. May I now request Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, sir, to address the gathering, sir, please.
first of all i want to thank organizers to give me opportunity to talk to you with face to face in fact i know many of the participants on the dais and off the dais so it will be very difficult to take the names i'll simply say my dear friends on the dais and off the dais and uh, participants from uh, the other countries other participants and dear students and uh, before uh, going forward i want to congratulate those who presented their papers and uh, got recognition in the form of certificate that will go long way in their career because science is uh, more of a thinking thing and presenting paper means you have started thinking it is with great pleasure and privilege that i stand before you today to address such a distinguished gathering of experts researchers policy makers and stakeholders from across the globe at the valedictory session of wva india conference 2024 the policy sector plays a very key role in the global food security providing a vital source of protein to billions of people across the globe it is not just about eggs and meat it is about nourishing communities supporting livelihoods and driving economic growth however with this importance comes a great challenge also we are tasked with ensuring that poultry production is sustainable efficient and resilient in the face of evolving challenges india has vast resources of livestock and poultry which play a vital role in improving the socio economic conditions of rural masses as per the latest livestock census poultry population rose by 17% from the previous count and that is around 73 million egg production in the country has increased to close to 130 billion and broiler meat production is estimated at around 4.7 million tons in the year 2021-22 indian poultry market is valued at us dollar 30.46 billion in 2023 aided by increasing popularity of online services and growing online food delivery channels the market is expected to witness a compound annual growth rate of 8.1% during 2023-2028 and projected to reach usd 44.97 billion by year 2028 you know while we are uh, going for uh, awareness programs in the states and talking to other stakeholders including industry our main argument is do you want to go for poultry or you want to go for other sectors like service sector manufacturing sector so because if uh, one rupee will fetch you more then you will go to that sector but people say that uh, it's okay growth is fine but uh, poultry or animal husbandry sector is a little tough sector earning money or wealth from this sector is not easy and uh, earning wealth from other sectors is comparatively easy so this is uh, a little question which uh, the experts and researchers in the poultry will work on 
maybe because you are dealing with life so the possibility of uh, life uh, getting destroyed is more and life is uh, requiring input also so that cost is also rising taking care of life is also difficult so maybe these are the factors uh, so that we have to in the government also we are trying to simplify the procedures to help the sector so that uh, sector directly reaches to the beneficiary or the stakeholder and removing layers of bureaucracy in between that is one way because doing research on uh, hard science uh, is one and uh, doing research on processes and procedures is also very important thing because in the end of the day those processes and procedures will take the benefit of the technology to the stakeholder to the beneficiary so these two things go hand in hand so means that science of this kind which you call pure science and the managerial sciences they should go hand in hand with each other then one can uh, feel the impact otherwise generally what happens are scientists are uh, uh, coming up with the technologies but the technology reaching the ground taking loss of time and you know that to live to land is a major challenge in our country because that is a procedural issue how to cut in between that inertia which comes along so reducing that inertness i'll request even uh, the institutes like this and other i am very sure that paper must be there of management in all courses but uh, to relate uh, the science and technology with the management that uh, should be there i think the, the the academic institutions research institutions world over doing this because delivery is very very important even the bureaucrats you know coming through this upsc route i haven't seen that they are measuring up to the expectations of the country because the delivery part they are not knowing because delivery part uh, is a very important uh, one is uh, through the books you learn but the major part comes through the experience our ability to relate and book doesn't offer you that relationship experience offers so integration or marriage of theory and practical is very important and the country has already taken care of this in the curricula also they are telling but because when i go back recall my student days then i largely see that uh, we read things uh, to pass exams and then to find a job there is no much choice i landed up here you landed up there that's all so but is still that uh, lit churning of consciousness ability to think so to start at a student level and that will uh, take a country forward and that make all of us a uh, transition from a traditional society to knowledge society a thinking society why i am sharing this because you are all uh, scientists in one sense or the other and uh, the science uh, is not a very routine thing like uh, history or geography here you have to think even if you want to wrote even even then you have to think ratne ke liye bhi you have to have firm few markers so but let us uh, develop a habit of thinking and relating things if we do not relate our mind is always trying to relate things mind is very practical mind doesn't want to do wasteful things when mind is learning by rote then mind is literally forcing and stretching itself to the limit and that takes lots of energy and that in turn brings frustration boredom and all those things phir aap paan khane jate ho samajh mein nahi aa raha so my point is this that 
we should why i am stressing because i myself felt after passing academic institutions and when i landed into the job that uh, what was being taught is was not very very relevant although it was organized learning organized learning gives you a framework that for a research you know this is chapter 1 this is chapter 2 this is chapter 3 and this is chapter last that is a framework framework is offered but uh, then it becomes a ritual after some time you do research you are already knowing the result you simply put that into that framework and you get the phd and all so my point is this that uh, many and uh, i have also seen this that let us say i am from iit but uh, iit or iims uh, not a guarantee of very great stuff very great stuff because that mind evolves through selection and elimination process so there is no guarantee that those who are coming through the coaching or uh, privileged backgrounds they are getting into these institutions they are having ability to think when you face more problem struggle then you develop that thinking to surpass that issue or that problem so one should not get caught into the myth of that you are coming from this institution that's why you are better this is my personal experience i have seen the bureaucrats also coming very very smaller backgrounds and their ability to solve problem is much much higher so the feed conversion ratio in broiler meat production has come down to 1.5 to 1.55 against the 1.8 to 1.9 a decade ago with an efficiency improvement of 14% similarly in the layer and breeder sector as well hen housed eggs and hen housed hatching eggs has improvised to a great extent today layer bird during uh, her economic cycle is able to produce 330 edible eggs and a breeder bird lay about 180 eggs in her economic life cycle of 68 to 70 weeks innovation and technology will undoubtedly play a crucial role in overcoming the challenges whether is precision agriculture genetic engineering or digitalization embracing cutting edge solutions can enhance productivity improve animal welfare and minimize environmental impact however we must also ensure that these advancements are accessible and affordable to all stakeholders especially small holders small farmers who form the backbone of poultry production in many regions another issue which uh, constantly reflecting in government circles is this that uh, the man who is uh, last in the line all these technologies are not uh, somehow percolating those benefits to the person last in the line because a resourceless person and doesn't have much skill is only having a physical uh, presence in terms of his physical body can do physical labor how to utilize and allow this uh, latest technology and uh, latest uh, improvements to reach him also so that he also gets uh, into the mainstream of the country that is also another issue and the research should be focused on that also how to help resourceless and uh, skillless because most of your population gradually they will be skilled but in the beginning because in agriculture everybody knows in a small way that skill part so introducing technology in such a lucid simpler way that uh, you know it's like a car driver car driver doesn't know the technology involved in making the car but he knows how to drive 
that is same case with the other technologies also what science is involved in poultry technology the farmer a small farmer doesn't know but once you take the technology in a simpler way to him then he can drive the technology so that is another challenge uh, particularly in our country where millions of people are below poverty line and poultry is one of the sectors to eliminate poverty because its reach is very very wider penetration is much deeper fostering collaboration and knowledge exchange is essential for driving progress in poultry sector by sharing experiences expertise and resources we can accelerate innovation build capacity and foster inclusive growth initiatives such as research partnerships farming farmer training programs and public private partnerships are very valuable in this regard we must recognize the interconnectedness of the poultry industry with broader global challenges such as climate change food security and public health as we strive to build a more sustainable and resilient food system it is imperative that we adopt holistic approaches that consider the social economic and environmental dimensions of poultry production to harness this potential and drive sustainable growth in the poultry sector the government of india has implemented a range of policies and initiatives aimed at fostering innovation enhancing productivity and ensuring the welfare of poultry birds and farmers number of initiatives undertaken by the department of animal husbandry in dairy government of india has given acceleration to the poultry sector forward one or two schemes which are directly aiming to develop this sector i'll uh, share with you one is animal husbandry infrastructure development fund which is being implemented and this uh, corpus is 15000 crore since june 2020 it has been implement, implemented one of the objectives of the scheme is to fulfill the objective of protein and its quality food requirement of the growing population of the country and prevent malnutrition eligible beneficiaries like uh, farmer producer organizations msmes like micro small and medium enterprises section 8 companies or private companies individual entrepreneurs availing this credit facility 90% loan at a nominal rate and 3% interest subvention the central government is also providing credit guarantee of 25% of total borrowings for those projects which are fulfilling definition of msme projects under national livestock mission this is another scheme for development of entrepreneurs in rural poultry the central government is providing 50% subsidy that is rupees up to 25 lakhs to establish a parent farm rural hatchery brooder cum mother unit for production of hatching eggs with minimum 1000 parent layers and chicks and rearing of the set chick up to 4 weeks in the mother unit the eligible entities are self help groups farmer producer organizations farmer cooperatives and joint liability groups point is that the government uh, is helping both sectors in the poultry one is the raw material and another is the value addition of that raw material so when you know value addition done then there are two kind of things one is a primary processing and other is a secondary processing so this annual asvend infrastructure development fund is open this is the first time in this country that the private sector has been incentivized and the point was that if you want to go for manufacturing sector or service sector but i want to attract your investment in annual asvend sector that i am giving you 3% more than those sectors that facility so that you come into this sector 
and once you are getting habituated then you stay in the sect so this incentive is open and this has come up with a tremendous response from the industry and entrepreneurs another is for uh, uh, entrepreneurs because nowadays you know government uh, services or jobs in bulled over if the countries which are having more government jobs then their efficiency in creation of wealth decreases you have seen the example of communist world where even business is being run by the government right from defense to manufacturing manufacturing services in the beginning uh, our country was also doing uh, more or less like this we were calling it socialistic pattern of society most of the jobs were in the government but the uh, government system is having its limitations you you are needing let us say watch today so that your staff can come in the time and you can regulate the attendance through the watch in the government system it might take 6 months to purchase the watch why then your staff will keep coming late this is one example that how decision making is far flung and very very remote in the governmental setup accountability is very very remote in private sector because your money is at stake so all the time you are on your toes mental alertness is maximum when you are doing private business so your skill development your efficiency everything increases and uh, because now you want to take the business to second level so you are involving so many people also right from peon to the ceo i mean the top most professional who is well versed in terms of experience and theory through organized learning and unskilled man so that is giving you thrill all the time and uh, the darwin's uh, principle you know of evolution that says that private instinct is most powerful instinct in the world private instinct so all countries who are far ahead in creation of wealth you know they have privatized everything because in case of private except the protecting poor or that regulatory mechanism to bring order in the society or other sectors like little license little certificate this and that government must remain a regulatory body and that to not a very tough regulatory body very soft regulatory body what can i do type receptionist type otherwise what happens that uh, government strangulates business so i understood it right uh, after 3 4 years of my service that the way government behaves it doesn't offer ecosystem to create wealth conversion of raw instinct like mera kya hindi mein kehte hai na ki bhai mera kya hai isme so that instinct says ki mujhe tab milega when i will put my 100% government wala says i'll get my pay ek tarikh ko mil jayega और मुझे नौकरी से कोई निकाल नहीं सकता तो अब काम कहां फिर सो दिस इज आई मीन साइंस इज एवरीवेयर सो इन द गवर्नमेंट दैट प्राइवेट इंस्टिंग गेट्स सॉफ्ट इट्स नॉट वेरी अग्रेसिव लेड बैक एंड दैट फायर इज नॉट इन यू देन योर फायर गोज इन टू दीज पेपर्स बिकॉज दैट इज हेल्पिंग यू टू गेट प्रमोटेड so then you are running pillar to post from library to reading this book or that book and then uh, doing all this which is needed for promotion so question is that uh, to continue to remain original and real 
and not getting uh, motivated by other factors reshaping instinct uh, in terms of creation of uh, clean wealth that is uh, the requirement that mind should understand the importance of private sector and unfortunately even uh, people say that uh, being a bureaucrat i must not say but i always share that uh, bureaucrats all those who are scientists working in the government others working in the government they should also behave like uh, you are an individual in your own capacity and you are a private person you are not an entity of a system and we forget and we behave like entity or creation of a system we become representative of the system that is one so opening up uh, societies for new knowledge for new systems and not treating the people working in the private as others we are calling this othering othering the private sector so and private sector also has to measure up to the challenge that uh, they have to not pollute the governmental system in fast tracking their things many of them are approaching through this way that way because uh, they are also helpless how to fast track their things so they are developing uh, conniving this and that so that is a creating a very vitiated ecosystem so then uh, to keep the goodness intact becomes very very difficult so like a one health we also see one system no private no government so uh, private sector should also the moment uh, government sector starts appreciating private sector that will be the milestone acche log hain tax ki chori nahi karte hain ईमानदारी नकली माल नहीं बनाते हैं ठगते नहीं हैं ऑल दीज थिंग्स आर दे आर फॉर देम ऑल्सो सो इट्स टू वे एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट थिंग्स आर इंप्रूविंग ग्रेजुअली बिकॉज यू नो अ डिकेट बैक और इवन फाइव ईयर्स बैक ब्यूरोक्रेट फॉर नॉट स्पीकिंग लाइक दिस दिस इज एन एनलाइटनमेंट बिकॉज माइंड इवॉल्व इट टेक्स टाइम so uh, another scheme which i have told you because one scheme is a 50% subsidy to medium uh, kind of people those who have done mba and they want to do business and then they can avail that benefit under national livestock mission and we have made the system portal based online seamless and we have tried to remove bottlenecks so that intermediaries are not there no harassment but still human is human cow babes are there motivated interests are there so let us try to be good because that brings a peace of mind also so department of animal husbandry dairy has developed an online portal for all this and one can uh, use that portal and get the benefit these initiatives reflect the government's unwavering commitment to fostering a conducive environment for growth and development of the poultry sector in india however we recognize that the challenges facing the industry are multifaceted and evolving requiring continuous innovation and adaptation in conclusion let us seize this opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to advancing the poultry industry for the benefit of present and future generations by harnessing the power of innovation collaboration and sustainability we can build a more resilient equitable and prosperous poultry sector that nourishes millions of people supports livelihoods and protects the planet thank you very much again i want to congratulate
the organizers for giving me this platform to talk to you and everybody who did his or her bit in making this program successful. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for inspiring words. May I now invite Organizing Secretary, WVPA India Conference 2024, Dr. P.K. Malik for his words of thanks. So I'll not take much time. Uh, I know you people are waiting for high tea and feeling a bit sleepy post-lunch. Sitting is very difficult. So dignitaries on the dais, of the dais, ladies and gentlemen and dear students, fellow delegates, a good afternoon to all of you. As we draw the curtains of this enlightening conference, it gives me a great pleasure to extend a heartfelt word of thanks. First and foremost, on behalf of the organizing committee, I extend our gratitude to Dr. O.P. Chaudhary, uh, Secretary Department of Animal Husbandry and Daring, uh, for gracing this occasion as the chief guest. We deeply appreciate the time and effort, sir, you have taken to be with us today. And despite your busy schedule, your willingness to share your expertise, thought, and experiences left an indelible mark on all those present here. As a token of our appreciation, I would like to, or on the behalf of the organizers, to present you a memento as a symbol of our gratitude. I would request uh, the President WVPA India uh, to, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. I also extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. H. Rahman, sir, former DDG and Regional Representative South Asia Hillary, for gracing the occasion. Sir, your presence uh, has truly elevated the stature of uh, this conference and added a sense of distinction to this closing ceremony. So as a token of our gratitude, we would like to present a memento and I request Varmaji, uh, the president, uh, WVPA, to honor uh, Rahman, sir. I, on the behalf of NINP and my personal behalf, extend a special thanks to Dr. Varmaji, for having faith in us and entrusting the responsibility uh, to organize third annual conference of WEPA. In fact, uh, this is the third conference and out of three, this institute has or or organized two conferences and we only started, the first conference was held here. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, he constantly guided us since we perceived the idea of organizing the third conference and every day, or I should say, every minute he has monitored us, guided us, and provided all the uh, logical, uh, logistic supports. So thank you very much, sir. I would request uh, uh, the director of this institute to felicitate Varmaji for all of his kind help and support, uh, what we got to organize this conference. The General Secretary of the, the WVPA India branch, Dr. Shiris Nigam, uh, uh, the MD of EW Nutrition, whom I had a very long association, a long, long back. So I thank him for being with us today and sparing your valuable time and, you know, supporting uh, the society as well as this conference with money. So thank you very much. Uh, Nigam sir, and I would request uh, the director to to felicitate uh, the the uh, Dr. Nigam.
The organizing committee is also thankful to Dr. Dr. Ankes Goda of this institute for his constant guidance and providing all the logistic supports. So on the behalf of the organizers, I would felicitate you, sir. Please come. So it has been an honor and a privilege to collaborate with World Veterinary Poultry Association for promoting the excellence in poultry health and welfare. I would like to thank WEPA for giving us the opportunity to organize this conference. And one, our deepest gratitude goes to our esteemed national and international speakers whose expertise and insight have illuminated our minds and ignited discussions that will continue to resonate long after this event. Your willingness to share knowledge and experiences has really enriched all of us. We would like to thank the chairman, co-chairman, panelists, reporters, and moderators of various sessions for meticulously conducting the, the technical sessions, evaluating posters, and organizing the student elocution competition. The efforts of master and doctoral degree students are not worthy and uh, appreciable uh, for their participation in the student allocation competition. At least they came forward and I have shown the confidence. And I hope such activities will imbibe a lot of confidence in them. I also thank the conference delegates for the active participation and engagement. Your enthusiasm has created an atmosphere of the camaraderie and shared learning which lies at the heart of any successful conference. We are immensely thankful to our sponsors and partners whose generous support has made this conference possible. Your commitment to advancing, uh, your commitment to advancing the field and fostering collaboration is truly commendable. I would like to thank Dr. Selvaraj and his team for arranging the accommodation and transportation. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult without the support of the whole committee and the, the chairman. I also thank the public, uh, publication committee led by Dr. David for spending day and night and bringing out the, the nice compendium or souvenir and the compendium of abstract. I also extend the thanks to registration committee headed by Dr. Sugandhi We are also thankful to Dr. Colt and his team for the beautiful decoration of the storage stage and arranging all the logistics required. In fact, uh, uh, I got his support across the you know committees, irrespective of the committees, whenever and whatever is required, he was always available. So the organizers are also uh, thankful to Dr. Girdar, the chairman of food committee, and Dr. Aranga Sami and team for helping us time to time arranging the delicious food and delegates and coordinating the excursion trip to Mysore is also noteworthy here. I hope you enjoyed the cultural program and the saxophone during the gala dinner yesterday. The committee expressed heartful, heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Godaji and the team members for organizing the cultural program, saxophone and excursion trip. So we also thank the Campus Upkeep Committee for their hard work, Ramesh Ji and Govinda and the other uh, spending day and night to make up this event successful. I hope everybody enjoyed the aesthetic appearance of this institute. I'll be failing in my duties if I do not remember Dr. Raghavendra Bhattaji here, the Deputy Director General Animal Science on this occasion. We took this responsibility of organizing the WEPA conference when Bhattasar was the director of this institute. On behalf of the organizers and my personal behalf, I would like to extend heartfelt great thanks to Dr. Raghavendra Bhatta, DDG Animal Science, for his constant support, time to time guidance, and motivation. Even after assuming the charge of director general, he constantly monitoring the activity. I would also thank 
my colleague and junior Dr. Gopi, you know, for being with me all the time whenever any help was required. Last but not least, I would like to express our gratitude to in charge guest house, in charge auditorium, technicians, caterers, event management, and housekeeping. And so we tried our best to make your stay comfortable here and providing the quality food, ambience, and arranging best speakers in the respected area. If there was any shortfall, it was because of my negligence, and I take full responsibility and assure you that in future, we would try for a continual improvement. So I wish you a very happy back home journey, and Jai Hind. I request all to stand for national anthem. So I request all to join for Haiti. <laughs> 